All right, we should be live. Thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be looking at one of the fundamental differences between the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran or the God of Islam, however you want to put that. We'll be talking about how the God of Christianity is a God of reason, a God, a God who is consistent, who expects, or who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and all our understanding of him and how he interacts with the world is based on that. Meanwhile, we have comment here from someone going by the name Jesus prayed to Allah, which I can't bring up on the screen because it was made before we started, but he wrote earlier, two failed clowns are back with a laughing emoji. And this is the God of Islam. This is a God of pure will. It doesn't matter if something is true. It doesn't matter if something is logical. All that matters is you're able to force your will on someone else because ultimately the God of Islam is arbitrary. He changes his mind. He just, he's non-predictable. You may think that you've served him all your life and then you find out that you're going to hell or you, or you may have uh, been disobedient and, and not followed Islam all of your life. And then he just arbitrarily decides to put you in Jannah anyway. This is the, the difference between the God of a consistency, the God of Christianity, and the God of inconsistency, the God of Islam. Let me open us with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for the technology that allows us to share your truth with fellow believers and with unbelievers from all around the world. We ask that anyone watching today approach the material with an open mind, that they take a serious look at their own beliefs, whatever those may be, and ask if they hold up to scrutiny, if the God, their conception of God actually makes sense, or if they've just been blindly following propaganda and never have actually thought about uh, what they believe. We ask that you be with us today, that you guide our discussion, and you prevent us from theological error. We ask that anything that we say that is true and useful is remembered, shared, and applied to people's lives. And anything that we say that is use, is not useful or is false is simply forgotten. We ask that you be with us today, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Welcome back to the channel, Lloyd. You've had a lot going on recently. You've been recording with Jay Smith and Al Fadi. You want to tell us a little bit about what you've been up to before we get into today's topic? Well, yeah, thanks for the opportunity and good to be back here with you. Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to see so many of you in the chat. So I have recorded um, seven or eight episodes with uh, Jay Smith. Uh, those are being released at the moment, and I will be recording with him again, I believe, next week. And I've recorded 14 episodes with Al Fadi, and I will be doing more recording with him in August, and the episodes will be released from July. So I'm doing Sharia law. I'm going through the works of the Islamic scholars who defined the Islamic legal and political system. And uh, it is, uh, yeah, it is certainly causing uh, the Dawah Gandists to lose their tiny little minds. The most recent one, I discussed the law of Sab al Rasul, which is the laws against insulting the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, we, of course, the penalty for that is death for Muslims and non-Muslims. And uh, yes, Muslims are losing their minds. And also one, one thing that is interesting, not a single, not a single comment so far in this entire series has actually presented me the actual Islamic law where they've gone to and said, you're wrong. They'll, they'll tell me I'm wrong plenty, but they will not bring evidence. They'll simply make the claim. They will not bring evidence from the actual scholars to prove this. They cannot. Remember, Sharia is a secret. They cannot reveal it. It is treason and they will be killed. Right. And yeah, so, so there's nothing they can do. And also, don't forget, lying is obligatory in Islam. It's not just legal. It's obligatory. And also to tell the truth in Islam that is offensive, that causes embarrassment, is slander. Remember, telling the truth about Islam is slander. 
So yeah, I'll leave it at that, Dennis. And today we have a different topic. So your thoughts, any comments before we go? Yeah, well, you say it's a different topic, but I say that it's all related here. That that the reason Muslims have uh, or behave the way they do, um, you know, that they they strictly follow a law without thinking about it, they refuse to provide evidence. It all goes back to the conception of God. Their God is not a, a God of morality and moral principles. Theirs is a God of commands, ar somewhat arbitrary commands. Yes. If he says, uh, you know, don't murder anyone on Monday and Wednesday, no one questions why they're allowed to murder people on Tuesday. Because it, it, all the laws are ultimately arbitrary, and people study the Islamic laws to know where the bounds of what they're allowed to do are. Mm. Uh, or, as you could alternately put it, how to get around the laws, how to find ways to violate the spirit of the law, but not violate the letter. And in their opinion, that is being very uh, morally principled that you to learn the law so well that you can and still do what you desire but not violate the letter of the law on that point this manipulation actually is is a manifestation of will it is not a manifestation of logos thank you Kuraguan. also i should note it, christianity has moral law we're not a religion of law we're not a theocratic religion so we do not have civil law Whereas if you look at Judaism, originally had civil law, ceremonial law, and moral law. Islam smashes those three things together. It makes a soup out of them. So the moral, civil, and ceremonial law become one with no distinction. Christianity only has a moral law. Don't forget, Islam has no moral law. It has legal and illegal. Christianity has priests. Islam has lawyers. A, this is a distinct difference. We have priests, they have lawyers because they administer the law. And don't forget, what is unlawful can be made lawful through legal exceptions and loopholes, as Thaddeus just pointed out. And this is an example of will. Will is manipulation. Logos is truth. Uh, Buzzlejet uh, asked if you're going to put the Sharia links in the description box. And I already put a link to uh, Lloyd's complete archive, which will include the Sharia resources as well as other material, uh, but if there's something specific in mind from, say, the, the series with Jay that you were looking for, uh, let us know and we can point you in the right place. Yeah, guys, I have asked Jay about a thousand times too. <laughs> the problem is YouTube, Sharia Tube or whatever, has been corrupting any links that he posts in the description. Any links he posts are immediately corrupted and become useless. I have asked him to post them in a comment he did once, but he forgot to make it a pinned comment, so it's lost in a sea of a thousand comments. So, yeah, uh, go to my channel. There is a community post recently discussing with the, with links to everything that I'm referencing right now. But at that is we can make a pinned comment with everything that people need towards the end. Yes, absolutely. So would you like to start on the presentation then? Yeah, of course. I can start sharing. So let me go. I'll just share my screen. Makes it easier. <clears throat> okay, so let me see. So we... Okay, the discussion today is about God being Logos and Allah being Will and the difference between those two. So the devil's greatest trick. Now, of course, we know the quote, the, de the greatest trick the devil pulled was to convince everyone that he doesn't exist. Now, what nearly everybody in my life had misunderstood about Satanism was that it is not about ritual sacrifices, digging up graves, and worshipping the devil. The devil doesn't exist. Satanism is about worshipping yourself, because you are responsible for your own good and your own evil. Christianity's war against the devil has always been a fight against man's most natural instincts for sex, for violence, for self-gratification, and the denial of man's membership in the animal kingdom. The idea of heaven is just Christianity's way of creating a hell on earth. That's Mar Marilyn Manson, the long, hard road out of hell. And I'd say there's some truth and there's some falsehood there. But Now, the statement, do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. This is something that is very, very intimately involved, bound up with the concept of modern Satanism. If you go back to someone like Alastair Crowley. So this popular saying originates with Alastair Crowley, who lived from 1875 to 1947. And this is in his infamous Book of the Law. And the word of the law, as he coined it, is thelema, or thalema, most commonly said thelema. 
And he said, who calls us the Lemites will do no wrong if you look but close into the word, for they are there in three grades, the hermit and the lover and the man of earth. So any comment before I continue, Thaddeus? Well, yeah, the audience might be wondering, uh, you know, we're, we're here to talk about Allah and, and uh, the biblical God, Yahweh. So why are you talking about, you know, uh, the occult and Satanism? And uh, to that, I would just say, be patient. And you'll, you'll see that this has an eerie similarity to the things taught by Islam as we go along. Now, of course, we believe that Satan does exist, that there are forces in the world that are evil, that have a mind of their own, let's say, a mind of their own. That have a personality however now what marilyn manson says the devil doesn't exist but he says it's about worshiping yourself self-aggrandizement compare this to muhammad right who must be regarded as absolutely perfect you're responsible for your own good and your own evil this is works this is earthly gratification this is purely self-satisfaction without consideration for what may come after without consideration for your fellow man do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Do what you want to satisfy yourself. This is the law of the jungle. This means imposing your will, dominating others without regard for the impact that you have on the world. Now, of course, Christianity wants to try to restrain those impulses because it wants us to lead a moral life. Now, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law, but do what thou wilt is actually the whole in the law because your parents don't let you do what you want because we don't always have perfect knowledge. So we do things that are evil, we do things that are short-sighted, and we need to follow some sort of moral compass. We need to have some sort of guidance because we've known, we've learned through history, our culture and society has learned that some things need to be constrained, restrained for us to live harmoniously as a group. Um, anything else before I continue, Thaddeus? Yep, you're good. Now, Crowley's first wife, Rose, she saw a demonic vision in Egypt in 1904, and she said, they are waiting for you. And he who was waiting was Horus, Rose Crowley, the great beast, age 58. So at the Cairo Museum, she exclaimed, there, there he is, seeing an image of Horus painted on a wooden plaque. It was exhibit number 666. Whether this is factual or has been dramatized, I leave that to you to decide. But this is the legend that has, this is the story. Crowley summoned his higher power, this higher power. So a book was revealed to him while in a trance. He received a book while in a trance. Maybe in a cave, I don't know. I am the snake that giveth knowledge, the spirit said. To worship me, take wine and strange drugs, whereof I will tell my prophet, the book of the law, 2.22. And the message from the demonic spirit, as Crowley wrote in it, is to do what you will, to do your own thing. Now, this is a very hippified message. It's a very common new age message. Just hang out, just do what you want. Understand, this means that ultimately, slowly but surely, you become... Corrupted. You start to do what you want against the moral fabric of society and you want to do your own thing. You impose your will on others and you defy what we have established as moral law within our society. Now, Satanism teaches that the highest authority is self. He tells readers how to gain worldly fame and fortune through devil worship. But really, worshipping the devil means that you follow your own whims, that you worship yourself. You set yourself as the highest authority. You reject any external authority. That is your comment? Yeah. Uh, no one's going to, generally speaking, no one's going to go around and say, you know, I worship Satan. But uh, a large percentage of people do, in reality, worship themselves. That They make themselves their own judge. They make themselves the authority over what is right and wrong. And so we don't see people generally speaking, declaring, you know, I, I'm a Satanist, I, I worship Satan. Uh, and that's the, the trick here, you know, it, it's a little more subtle than that. Satan doesn't come in an unappealing form that anyone would just uh, reject, rather he comes in an appealing form, telling you that you are, are a god, you have the ability to determine what's right and wrong. Yeah, actually, if you read the manifesto, I don't have it, no, I'm not going to find it now. If you read the manifesto of the Church of Satan, it has things like follow your own way, find your own freedom, express your own truth. These things do not seem harmful. They seem entirely benign. If we, at some point, I should, I should actually just post this, but once you see it, you read it, it looks entirely harmless and benign. This is the manifesto 
of the Church of Satan. I will throw in a point here. There's an excellent book by M. Scott Peck called The People of the Lie, right? M. Scott Peck. He was a psychologist who studied different religions to try to find one that suited him and eventually became a Christian because he felt that this had the highest moral system, right? The most highly developed sense of theology and morality. And he studied people who were liars. He studied psychopaths. So, and he wanted, he was curious about what is the philosophy, what is the difference between people who are good and people who are evil? How can you find a psychological definition of good and evil? Not from a theological point of view, but certainly that obviously was something he was curious about. But how, how in psychology can you work towards a definition of evil? And he, in his practice, what he said eventually was that people who try to be good, what sets them apart from people who turn evil is that people who are good have a higher power outside themselves. And before they do an action, they consider, what would my mother think of me if I did this? What would my father think of me? What would God think of me? What would Jesus think of me if I were to do this? What would they do? So they would submit themselves to a higher authority and they would compare themselves to that standard, that absolute standard of good, of morality. What he said is that people who turn to evil, people who become psychopaths over time, they set themselves as the highest moral standard. They are the arbiter of right and wrong. They are the ones who decide what is good, and thus what is good is what benefits them. And you, you may be thinking that this doesn't necessarily sound like Islam, uh, that then, you know, Muslims won't set themselves as the authority. They'll say that Muhammad is the perfect example to follow. But do they really? Or do they say, whatever I don't like about Muhammad's biography is untrue, and whatever I think he should have done is true, even if it isn't actually in his biography? Right. So this is the books that he wrote, the Book of the Law, and the Book of Lies, and the Book of the Law. All right. Now, Thelema. Thelema, in English, is the English transliteration of the Koine Greek noun, right, produced, well, meaning will from the verb thelo, to will, to wish, to want, or to have a purpose. Now, in 1904, Crowley wrote that he had received the book of the law dictated to him by an entity named Ewas, which was to serve as the foundation of the religious and philosophical system that he called the Lima. So he identified himself as the prophet of a new age, the Eon of Horus, based on a spiritual experience that he and his wife had in Cairo. So by his account, the being that called itself Ewas contacted him through Rose, through Eve, the snake contacted Eve, <laughs> and subsequently dictated a text known as the Book of the Law, or Libra of the Legis, which outlined their principles. And do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, meaning that adherents of the Lima shall seek out and follow their true path to find and determine their true will. Now, understand, do what thou wilt, follow your free will, follow your will, find your path. This would sound like noble advice, but this is the foundation of Satanism. And uh, the foundation of modern Western society as well. Uh, that, that, you know, we're, we're teaching children in, in schools, just follow your dreams, whatever you want, you can have. And uh, it sounds good, you know, it sounds noble, but it's not reality. It, it's not the way the world actually works. And when you set people up for this, one of two things will generally happen. Either they'll become a, it, egotistical uh, maniac when they succeed they'll, they'll be viewing themselves as you know this great person who was able to achieve all this or they'll fail and then they will have a diminished self-image and they, they will be viewing themselves as failures as losers because they were not able to achieve their dreams and all they had to do is dream hard enough and, and then they would have it so what does that mean for them when they don't achieve that anger, frustration, and also it means that you lose contact with reality. You lose contact with, with objective reality. You overestimate yourself. So we're going to be using an article. Uh, we're going to be basing a talk off an article called God as Logos, Allah has willed by Father James Shaw, which is a discussion of Pope Benedict the 16th Regensburg address, right? And also I'm going to be using the Reliance of the Traveler, as always, right? The most popular Islamic law text in the world. And I will also be referring to the Blue Letter Bible for various sources. Now, Regensburg. So on September 12th, 2006, Pope Benedict XVI spoke at the University of Regensburg. He highlighted the Christian understanding of God as Logos. And he quoted a 14th century Byzantine emperor, Manuel II, 
who said, show me just what Muhammad brought that was new. And there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. Now, Pope Benedict added that violence is incompatible with the nature of God and the nature of the soul. Islam and Christianity are two religions with a universal vocation. It is normal that there be frictions. Cardinal Tauran said at a press conference, according to Lacroix, this is a journalist. But the difference is that we propose and they impose. So we propose an idea and we consider, let's discuss this and let us analyze and apply. They impose with their will. They impose through force, through dominance, through the sword. That is the difference between reason and logos and will. Now, God is logos, therefore God is reason. So Benedict's aim was not to champion reason alone, but he wanted to champion what is called ratio recta or right reason. Now, being Christian, and I'm not going to get into a discussion with people about Catholicism being a different religion and Catholics are evil. Leave that behind for the moment, please. I would appreciate that. So now atheists, for instance, claim to utilize only reason. Well, that is will, because what is your standard of reason? What is your ultimate standard of good that you compare against your own feelings? Who is the prophet of atheism? Do we go to, I don't know, Thunderfoot on YouTube? Is he the prophet of atheism? That is the standard of everything that is right. Does he have perfect knowledge? No. So we don't know. In fact, the problem is that you create social friction if you don't have a standard you can compare against. You create social friction in that you you start to divide society. You have uncertainty because when you have someone who claims to have Christian morality, you know what they believe and what they do not believe. You know what they support and do not support. When someone says they're an atheist, are they a communist atheist? Are they a Satanist? Are they, are they you know, in disguise? Are they, what do they follow? What is their philosophy? What do they believe? What do they stand for? What do they not stand for? You don't know. This creates confusion within society and therefore society starts to crumble because you destroy social trust. So uh, comments, Thaddeus, before I go on? Yeah, uh, you know, this is all really good material. And, and this is kind of uh, the difference between a classical understanding of, of the importance of, of education and this contemporary idea of education, where we're like, you know, it's all about in, in enhancing the children's self-esteem. It's all about, uh, you know, following your dreams. It's all about tolerance. Well, what kind of tolerance is that? Well, only tolerance for the ideas that we want to teach. <laughs> not, not, you know, you, you dare to say that I think that homosexual sex is a sin, for example, and, oh, you're an intolerant person. Well, you're not being tolerant of my beliefs, now are you? I'm not saying that, that we should be throwing homosexuals off rooftops like they do in Islam, but you, but you say Islam's perfectly fine. Uh, so really, it, it's, it's not about tolerance at all. It's about teaching people to have a very specific set of ideals. Right. Tolerance of what? Correct. Where is the line? We just don't have that certainty because we don't know what they really believe in terms of their moral core. So it was a challenge. Now, do note that after he gave this talk about Islam, Pope Benedict was effectively deposed as Pope because in history, when a Pope dies, you get a new Pope. Pope Benedict is still alive, so he was clearly deposed in a coup. It was a challenge to the dictatorship of relativism that he tried to confront and crush. So his statement saying, look, there is objective reality, there's objective morality, right? And he said, we as a church need to return to objective reality and objective morality. And we need to fight against those things which stand against us. And of course, for this, he was vilified. Now, the Holy Father, he posed the fundamental question that lies behind the discussion about Islamic terror. He dared to question Islam, and he suffered a major backlash. Now, if God is Logos, it means that a norm of reason, reason follows from what God is. God is therefore rational, and God is therefore logical. Now, I will state, for instance, that it's atheists that are pushing the idea of, ooh, follow the science, believe the science, like tobacco science, right? Um men can fall pregnant right uh no no they can't that is atheists pushing that idea now within christian belief we have men we have women 
um, in atheism, you have, and these are atheists pushing this in that you have 4,000 different genders. No, you don't, right? We have just thrown all of biology out of the window, but trust the science, trust their science. That is will, that is imposing their will, that is manipulating reality, which is will, that is not logos, that is not rational or logical. So things are within the Christian philosophy, we believe that things are because they have natures and they are intended to be the way they are because God is what he is. God is order. Therefore, nature is ordered. Therefore, there is logic within nature, within reality. Uh, your thoughts, that is. Yeah, the, um, you know, we're, we're often told that there's this war between Christian, Christianity and science, between Christianity and reason, uh, between Christianity and atheism. But Christianity is the religion that teaches rational ideas. It, it teaches there is an objective reality. The reason that uh, Western science came about is because people were expecting God to have a consistent nature, and thus they expected there to be natural laws. So this is actually quite different than what any other religion ever taught. They all taught that, that God, the God or gods were arbitrary beings that, you know, they're kind of like human beings with superpowers. They might change their mind one day. Um, so there was no reason to look for natural laws because no one expected that. They expected chaos. And, and what do we see now? We, we see the rise of, you know, this post-modernism, this idea that there is no truth, that everything's relative. Uh, but at the same time saying everything's relative, but Christianity's false. Uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But this is the battle of reason versus will. And someone saying, you know, I'm right because I'm right versus someone saying I'm right because of the objective reality and the facts that I've discovered about that, A, B, and C. Fantastic. Yeah, very well said. And we will we'll cover that. We'll come more into that topic again. Uh, Andrew Martin just stated Aaron Ra has come out as a Satanist. Uh, if that is true, wow. Wow, that's exactly what I just mentioned. And I've always felt that there's something, well, I've always felt that he was. So, so yes, um, understand will is satanic, right? Will that is unfettered with reason is satanic, right? So let me continue. Um, thanks for that news. That, so what is logos or the logos as some might call it? So the logos is Greek for reason. Now understand there are many, many definitions of logos, but it also depends on context. There's philosophical, the philological. There's, so depending on what you're trying to deal with, there will be different definitions. For our purpose, we're using one set of definitions. So you can find five different categories of definitions, at least that I found for this. But logos is Greek for reason, for word, for speech or principle. But notice word and speech. In short, it is logic. Now, we need to conceptualize this as articulated truth, verbalized, spoken. It is the truth that is spoken, right? And of course, if we extend that metaphor to Jesus, the birth of Jesus, the truth is alive and the truth has spoken, right? So it is the truth that is seen. Right? Now, in Greek philosophy, it's related to universal divine reason, the mind of God, so that the universe, the world, the our creation is modeled on the mind of God. Therefore, it is rational. There is logic to it. There are rules to it that we can learn. And we can thus discern the mind of God. And we can do so because our entire being is also modeled in the image of God. Would I be correct in saying that, that is? That would be correct. Now, the Gospel of John connected this Greek term with the nature and existence of God and Jesus Christ. So the Logos is connected to God to existence and to Jesus Christ. Logos is broadly defined as the word of God. Notice the word again, the spoken truth. We have to speak the truth, articulate the truth. It is the principle of divine reason. It is the creative order. So we believe that life is ordered. God is order. God is reason, right? And in our worldview and in our scriptures, it is the truth conceived in the mind and expressed by language. Notice when you, uh, if you guys have been following the <laughs> the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial, Amber Heard cannot give a straight answer. If you've been dealing with Islamic dawagandists, they cannot give you a straight answer. What's one plus one? You you cannot get a straight answer. Understand? We need to be able to express 
let your yes be yes, let your no be no. However, when you start to hear a bunch of sophist waffle, you are not dealing with reason. You're not dealing with logos. You're dealing with sophistry. You're dealing with the, the manipulation of will. Hey, speaking of people with uh, no mm -hmm. logos, Safras has entered the chat. He says, Lloyd, our Google Scholar. Yeah, it's I've used Google to do the most amazing detailed research. <laughs> you should try it sometime. Yeah, all you had to do is put in, in, in Google, please prepare a new presentation for me on a subject critical of Islam. And boom, the whole thing came up. All I did is copy and paste it. <laughs> and, and now we're, we're giving it to you. Yeah. And when I read directly from the, the Islamic law, the ijma, the consensus of the scholars, did those scholars Google that? Because I'm reading straight out of the Islamic text, the authentic Islamic legal text of the schools of fiqh, right? The madhabs. Did, did I Google that? Did the scholars Google that? Because I'm, I'm surprised you, you seriously got to get your facts straight. Now, identified in the Gospel of John with the second person of the Trinity. So the Logos is identified in the Gospel of John with the second person of the Trinity, thus, and it's incarnate in Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the Logos. He's the Word of God, but also he's expressed in the personhood, in the incarnation of Jesus. So what is the Logos? Two. Let's look at John 1, the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? Now in Strong's G3056, you'll have the Strong's Dictionary has uh, H and G words, Hebrew and Greek. Right? It's a masculine noun. It's a spoken word. Notice a spoken word. It's a concept or idea or a decree, right? It's a mandate. It's an order. It is something that is in integral, intrinsic to the being of God, right? Intrinsic to the nature of reality. It's a moral precept of God. It's a weighty saying. It is an instruction. So there's something about law to it, but it's not civil law, right? The root word, the etymology is G3004, lego, to say, to speak out, to call, to tell, to affirm, to affirm a teaching, right? Something that it's instruction again, to advise, to command, to direct, to intend, or to name, to use the correct name, to identify, to be clear about things, the categories that things are in, man, woman, right? Now, in John, Logos denotes the essential word of God, Jesus Christ, who is the personal wisdom and power in union with God. So he is one with God. The Logos is one with God, but he... This is also his ministry in creation and the government of the universe. So the Logos, the universe, runs on the principle of reason. It's the cause of all the world's life, both physical and ethical, which the procurement of man's salvation puts on human nature in the person of Jesus, the second person in the Godhead, and thus shone forth conspicuously from words and deeds. So Logos must be spoken. The truth must be heard. Uh, Thaddeus, over to you. Yeah, we have uh, another uh probable Muslim in the chat here going by the name Palestine. I believe you've interacted with him on Jay's channel. I think I saw that. Um, he is uh, jumped into the chat and he's already getting ahead of it, uh, you because he's demonstrating sophistry, which you're about to talk about. Amazing how this works. Ah, oh, so Frost just said, we're not scared to say death to apathy. Yeah, I was going to gonna... cause corruption. Well, actually, Incredible. there's a better comment from Safraz here. He says, Islamic law is beautiful. We are strong in our laws, deaf to apostates in Muslim nations who cause corruption. And would you, would you like to offer Safraz the opportunity to come up here live and discuss Islamic law with us? Uh, read Safraz, through it. Over the last many, many months, I have dozens of times invited you to come up for us to talk about these beautiful laws, these laws that you claim are so beautiful. Let us just read them and you can give us your opinion, your comments. I will read the laws and you can tell us why they were written, how wonderful they are. If they are beautiful, there is nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be ashamed of. And you can show us why we should adopt these laws, which include killing people who leave Islam, which include killing people who criticize Muhammad. Criticism of Muhammad is defined in Islamic law as not believing Muhammad is totally perfect. And of course, laws that allow grown men, grown adult men to, I'll use the word diddle, legally diddle infants, infants who are in the cradle. This is legal in Islam. Men can have, you know what, this is all defined very clearly and your scholars have written this. So please come up. Let's have that conversation. 
for some reason, you always comment on my videos, but you are too afraid to meet me. You claim ignorance, uh, yet you want to comment. Go on, Thaddeus. Uh, mm -hmm. I put the link in the live chat. To be clear, this is only an invitation to come up and read and discuss the laws. If you come up and you try to talk about something else, you will be re removed from chat. Um, Safras has joined, but his camera is not connected, so I can't add him to the stream at the moment, but hopefully he gets that corrected. All right, he says put me on, so yeah, fascinating. <clears throat> oh, here he is. Here's the man. I'll get my references up. Welcome, Safraz. You've been invited up to read and discuss Islamic law with us. If you try, if you try to change the topic, you will be removed. That was why you were invited up. So Lloyd is working on pulling up some references to read and discuss right now. We're changing the topic of today just for you. Apostates, yeah. Hello. He wants to go to apostate laws, apparently. Apostates, yeah, I would say straight up, death to anybody that leaves Islam and cause corruption in Pakistan, Africa, wherever. I don't care. Kill them off. You're right, Thaddeus. He is becoming more extreme. No, yes. it's not extreme. It's not, it's not extreme. No, it's well, awesome. well, you're, cor you're correct, it's actually, Safraz. It's not extremism. This is proper it Islam, is. but it's what most Muslims would deny. They would say. I'm meaning his statements are becoming extreme. This is Azima. Islam has Azima and Ruhsa, leniency and strictness. He is simply now being strict. This is the correct Sunni Islam. He is being 100% correct. So, yes. uh, why is this good? <laughs> because you see, in the West, it was once a. Christian country, strict Christian country, no LGBT, none of this rubbish was happening in the West, strict, happy Christian country, but now you, you've, you've gone so weak in your laws, look at the state of the West, USA, England, Europe, LGBT have taken over, which is wrong, these were strict Christian countries, happy, happy, clean countries, now everything's taken over, the atheists, taken over, LGBT have, have taken over. But you look in Arabia, they're strict. They don't allow this rubbish. They don't allow this LGBT atheism crap. They're strict. Yeah? Okay, so all you've made is a statement of your beliefs in a different way. We're asking why you think that this is a good law to have. You, you stated that it was good to kill apostates and then you just kind of restated that in a different way, saying that if uh, the West was practicing Islam, you would be killing uh, gay people specifically in this case, but various other things as well. So again, why is an apostasy law a good thing? Why is a law executing someone for leaving Islam a good thing? I'm not. I'm not saying just kill them like that. I'm saying if they if they uh, leave Islam and if they start like attacking Islam in the same country, they have to be put to death. That's okay. what is. Uh, but but okay. you're you're missing my question. No, the question isn't what lawsuits. the law is. It's what why that? you think it's a good thing. Because they're causing corruption in the land. Anybody that Quran says it, if they cause corruption in the land, kill them, which is good. It's good. So it should be noted that when you join Islam, when you say the Shahada, it is a contract. The Shahada is technically a contract. So the, the technical name is Bayah. So when you make Bayah, you effectively, and also this contract falls under commerce. It falls into the domain of commerce. It's a commercial transaction. That is under what context do you sell your allegiance to a particular deity with, within, our, within, our, within our theological uh, understanding? To whom do you sell your you know, your eternal soul. Your soul, yes. Uh, well, you certainly can't sell your soul to Yahweh because he already is the proper owner of your soul. You can only sell your soul to a false deity such as Satan himself. So within Western context, we sell our souls to Satan. Now in Islam, 
So you have signed a contract, you've sold your soul to Allah. And when you break that contract, you are then punished with death. Notice it says whoever voluntarily leaves Islam is killed. So you are killed for leaving voluntarily, right? So it doesn't say anything about if you go therefore and slander Islam afterwards. It just means that you leave Islam. So apostasy from Islam, right? It says here when a person who has reached puberty and is sane voluntarily apostatized from Islam, he deserves to be killed. So this is, you may be killed on sight. You may be killed on the spot. There is no necessity for them to give you one day or three days and so on. They can literally kill you on the spot. This is what ISIS would do. They're simply being strict. Any additional time is rukhsa. It's simply being lenient. Uh, your thoughts, that is surprise. So why should we want to have these laws? Why is a good thing? Why do you think, why, why do Muslims lie about this? What is the shame when they should simply be honest that this is the Islamic law? Well, I don't, I don't know what it is, but I know that I don't know one thing is these is, is Islamic countries today, they don't kill them. They just eat. Just They're not fully them. under the Sharia. They are not. You know, many, many people are killed in the West, in Nigeria, in India, in Pakistan. They are killed. But Sharia is not fully in effect yet. It's only partially. Yeah. But these are these Africans are a bit uh, crazy. They're, they're a bit wild, aren't they? They're a bit wild people. Like if anybody says any little thing, they just stone them and put them to death, which is actually wrong. But you don't see that happening in Arabia, that the, in the, you know, the Arab world. So you're contradicting yourself. You came in here and you said yeah. that the apost the death penalty for apostasy was good and justified. Yeah. Now you seem to be saying it's good that, or maybe you're saying that's bad that Arab countries are not fully following these laws. That they are some way subject to the West. There, there's some way a that is actually the reason they're not fully following these is because they have to have relations with the Western countries to buy their oil and they don't want to be too offensive. They don't want to, you know, be too blatant about enforcing the, these kind of things because there'll be an international uprising against them. So are, are you saying that the, those countries are being bad and not properly following the laws or are you changing your opinion and saying that uh, these laws should be moderated. To be honest, yeah, I don't, I don't know about the, I don't know about killing them for just for, you know, for leaving. But I know for the fact in uh, Saudi Arabia that they kill them for putting, uh, you know, attacking Islam. They'll actually know that they'll, they'll actually know, they'll actually know leave Islam and then they start, you know, going on the internet and start to, uh, you know, attack Islam. So. Then Even Saudi Arabia is under pressure from Islamic law, from international observation. If if the Saudis want to do trade and do deals and business with the West, they also need to do some level of moderation of their policy so that they are not offending other states. Because if they had to implement this fully, they would simply become pariahs on the world stage. So they're allowed under Islam to practice leniency. This is just rukhsa. Uh, I want to change the topic. So, yeah. Safraz, yeah. do you admit that it is legal in Islam for a grown man to have sex with minor children, including infants, <coughs> to have full not, sex? No, 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 no. Not, not now. No, no, no. I don't not now. That. So, no, not no, now. No. So, it was once? It was once happening everywhere around the world. Arabia, Israel, wherever you went. The West was doing it as well. Every Everyone was doing it, but now they've got no laws. And in Islam, you have to follow the laws of the land, wherever. Laws, wherever okay, that's, that's so. Hopefully, you can bring some evidence that states that. I'm going to go through the laws on, well, the laws of marriage and divorce of minor children, including infants, and I want your comments on this. So we're going to go to Pakistan. Now, once I showed this to a, Pakistan, to a Muslim, sorry, he told me that Pakistanis are not real Muslims. So I hope that's not going to be your comment. But we're going to look at Quran 
<laughs> no, this is a document by two professors of law in Pakistan. And it says here, on the basis of the analysis of reported cases, the following books are found to be relied upon more frequently by the courts to derive an authentic point of Islamic law. And they quote, the first book is the Hadaya, which is the major fiqh manual, the major Sharia law manual of the Hanafi school of fiqh. Then you've got the digest of Muhammadan law and a couple of others. So let's go have a look at this digest of Muhammadan law. The two professors involved are Shahbad Ahmed Chima, professor of law, PhD. Uh, this is at the Punjab University. And of course, Sameer Ozer Khan, right? They are verifiably professors at these locations. This is the book that the Pakistani courts refer to. And it states here, when a man has had sexual intercourse with a girl under the age of nine years and he has ruptured the parts, this means he has destroyed her vagina. It is unlawful for him to have further connection with her, but she's not released from her ties if connected with him by marriage or slavery. If no rupture has taken place, in other words, if she is, you know, if he has not destroyed her vagina through copulation, the prohibition is not incurred according to the most valid opinion. This tells us that adults may have sex with minors, right? This is a girl under the age of nine, and you may have sex with slave girls who are minors under the age of nine. Please tell us why this is moral and why this is right, and we should allow this. Lloyd, that the other guy told me this is Pakistan, and Pakistan is one screwed up country. I'm from Pakistan. No, I'm no, no. Pakistan. This is this is Sharia law. The Hanafi well, school of fiqh is Lloyd, global. That's a good country. That, this, they, no, no. We are. This is an example that Pakistan, an Islamic country, uses this. You are Pakistani. But they are you from a screwed up? Are you screwed Islam. up? They don't follow Islamic uh, laws there. They don't do so anything. So what, what do they follow, Safraz, if it's not Islamic law? Because ninety nine percent of the country is Islamic. I go there, I go there about once every year or so, yeah, and they've got gays, they've got lesbians, they've got anything on, on the on the streets around there. They don't do that anymore. They don't follow Islam all there. They're not interested. They, so they're not real Muslims. Okay, so we've got so yeah, back to they're not they real Muslims. Let's continue. So, law. so let's continue. Right, now, it says there is no waiting period for a woman divorced before having sex with her husband. Fantastic. Now we're dealing with Quran 65.4, which states, as for your women who have despaired of further menstruating, if you are in doubt, their waiting period shall be three months. And for those who have not menstruated yet, they will also have a waiting period of three months. In other words, they are too young to menstruate. They are minor children. Now it states here in this law, it's screwed up, yet it goes there every year. I know. No, a waiting period is obligatory for a woman divorced after intercourse, so she's had sex. Whether the husband and wife are prepubescent, they have reached puberty, or one has and the other has not. And intercourse means copulation. Now, this is the most popular Islamic law manual in the world. It's found all over the world in Islamic Lloyd, you know that now, this, now, this allows on, prepubescent Lloyd. sex. Now, why Lloyd, is this good? How is this? Yeah, now, you say... Hey, this Sa is wait, wait. Let, it, let Lloyd finish and then you can talk. Now, Okay, okay. Now, you have told us many, many times that um, that apparently in the Bible, young yeah. children have been diddled and this is evil. Here we have the eternal law of Allah, eternal, will never expire. And this is legal in Islam, and it will be. If there's a caliphate, this will become the law. Infants, it will be legal for adult men to have sex. Pedophilia will be legal. How is this good? If it's evil in the Bible, evil in Christianity, supposedly, how is it not evil in Islam? How is Islam then not evil? For for me, uh, I don't believe that was that this is, was for the future. It was just for that that time, whatever. It, whatever, whatever no, it, this is the Sharia is eternal. The law of Allah is eternal. If Please show me eternal, evidence that this. No, show me the evidence. Show me from the fiqh. I just show you the fiqh. Eternal, show then me. All these other countries will be following it, but they're not. It was just for that. It was just for that time. No, I've just explained to you. They're supposed. To, you're supposed to form a caliphate and then impose this law. This is the law. Sharia for Britain. You want Sharia for Britain. This is the Sharia. Why is this good? Why should we allow this? How is this moral? Please tell me. For me, for me, uh, this cannot be happening at all. So you're saying that you disagree with Islam's best and most trusted scholars, the founder of Islamic law, the, the various founders of Islamic law. You say that you disagree with them. And the only response you can say is, for me, this is not good. Is that correct? This is not, 
this is this year what you're talking about is not is not for this time. It was only for that time. Simple as that. So wait, wait, hold on, oh. hold on. So so tell me in the Bible was you say that Christianity is evil because apparently we had pedophilia then, but it's not for this time. So how is it then okay in Islam, but it's not okay? In, this is the exact same situation. I'm not saying that. I'm how, saying how does your logic work? I'm saying to you that the Jews follow the Torah, and it was not the Torah is not. Do you this support thing. this law? Do you support this law? Yes or no? Yes, me about uh, kids under under age. No. This is consistent across all of the schools of fiqh. Every single one of your mujtahids who founded Islam, who founded your schools of fiqh, all of them agree with this. I don't, I don't believe that. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't seen any scholar agree with this. That this. This, this is, is the ijma. <laughs> this you're looking at the scholars agreeing. This is the ijma. This, this is the consensus. Book, yeah, this book, like what you're reading from here, yeah, is not trustworthy. It's not trustworthy. How do you know your opinion is trustworthy? Because you, you've got because you've got scholars, Arab scholars who are who are saying do not read, read this book. If you were if you were going to Islamic QA, they so uh, Islam QA. Hold on, so let's go to there. Islam QA. Actually, you know what? I will actually go there. Uh, since yes. I'm that's a good point. He he said that we can go to Islam QA. I was going to ask Q-A. him what we should go to if not uh, the classic manuals of Sharia, and he suggested Islam QA. So let's see what they have to say on this subject. Uh, while you're pulling that up, Carol said, aren't these scholars not to be questioned? And Vilna said, did Safras just leave Islam? Isn't this Sharia? Yep. Well, so I just I just pulled up Q and uh, is oh you already got it. Okay, you got it. Never mind. Yeah. So I'm going to bring up this is Islam QA. This is the ruling on acting and marrying young girls. Let's go. What is the so why in Islam are you allowed to marry children girls of age below ten without their permission? And can you justify this ruling of, of Islamic child marriage? This is a question by a Muslim. This is Fatwa number 22442, published on the 30th of June, 2002. Let's see what it says. Marrying a young girl before she reaches the age of adolescence is permitted in Sharia. There was scholarly consensus on this point. And those of your women as have passed the age of monthly courses, for them the Ida prescribed period, if you have doubt, is three months. And for those who have no courses, i.e. they are still immature, the Ida is three months likewise, Quran 65.4. Now, it states here in the fatwa, a girl who does not have periods because she is young and has not yet reached puberty. This indicates clearly that Allah has made this a valid marriage. The prophet married Aisha when she was six and he consummated when she was nine. And that is narrated by Bukhari, 4840 and Muslim, 1422. The prophet married Aisha when she was six and consummated when she was nine. Bukhari and Muslim and Muslim says seven years. Now, this does not mean that it is permissible, they say, to have intercourse with her, but we shall see as we go through the ijma, the consensus. If the husband and the guardian of the girl agree that this will not cause harm to the young girl, then that may be done if they both agree. It's like two wolves deciding if uh, it's good for them to eat the sheep. Abu Ubaid said that once a girl reaches nine, then the marriage may be consummated even without her consent. There's a word for that, G-R-A-P-E, remove the G. But that does not apply in the case of those of a girl who is younger, apparently. But notice, but you know, there is nothing in the hadith of Aisha to set an age limit or to forbid that in the case of a girl who's able for it before the age of nine. So it says here there's nothing to prevent this. Now let's continue. So Safros, we've just pulled up Islam QA, and this says that he's gone. Oh boy. Yes, Safras dropped out. Uh, you know, he was he did drop out involuntarily earlier. So I'll give him, I'll open the possibility that he just lost his internet connection, but the timing is awfully suspicious. He says, yeah. look at what they say on Islam QA. You are on about the second paragraph of what they say and he disappears. So we'll see if right. he pops back up. So I'll finish but, this section if I may, and then I'll go back to what we were doing that is. So thanks for yes. that. Yes, excellent. So when a woman who has been made love to, okay, performs the bath, the purificatory bath, and the male sperm leaves her vagina, she must repeat this bath, this purification, if two conditions exist. One, that she's not a child. So in other words, if she is a child, she doesn't have to take the bath, but rather, 
okay, although it does state that, okay, a full indemnity is paid for the injuries which paralyze these members or for injuring the peritoneal wall between the vagina and the rectum so they become one aperture. This refers now back to the first law that I read. So if a male, an adult male, abuses, rapes, rapes a young child and he rips the skin from vagina to anus, well, yeah, he needs to... Um, yeah, you called him any scholarly argument. Yeah, I'm trying to be polite about this. Thanks. Now, notice this is fit to educate women. Okay. This is a favorite with the people of the Indian subcontinent as well as the Indian Muslim diaspora all over the world. It's a comprehensive encyclopedia of fiqh, Islamic rituals and Islamic morals. If a person has sex with a minor girl, ablution will not be necessary. So this now confirms what the previous Islamic legal text said. But in order to get into the habit, she should be made to bath. That's a minor. A minor is someone who's not had puberty. Notice they now stipulate if a woman is underage, but not so small that if one has intercourse with her, there is fear of the vaginal tissues tearing. Now, that is, why would we be concerned about vaginal tissues tearing in an adult? Mary, do you have any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, as well. Um, yeah, I would actually love to talk about this topic because this is uh, this is something I discovered in the uh, manuals of Thick a long time ago. And then I lost it. I couldn't find it. And I recently found it when you covered it again. I'm so grateful. So a fistula is when there is such damage to the vaginal area that, this, that between the vagina and the rectum that rips open. And what happens from then on out during that woman's entire life, she leaks fecal matter. So she is incontinent. That basically means anywhere she goes, she's t constantly dripping poop, no matter where she goes. And her vaginal area, you know, smells like her anus would. It smells like feces. And she's constantly dripping poop because she doesn't have anything to hold in the right. And there are infections, there are other problems. Um, and so women who get this condition, obviously, they stink, they are completely shunned by society, they are despised, and it only, ha this is not ha something that happens in sexual intercourse between a, an adult woman and a man, unless it is one of the most catastrophically violent attacks that you could imagine. But because they are having they are having sex with a little girl so young that oops you might miscalculate if you just go and oopsie oh I thought it would be okay but it turned out that while I was having intercourse with her I ripped her apart permanently for the rest of her life right. well then I'm not supposed to have sex with her anymore if I have done that to her once so horrific. here's the thing this is absolutely horrific and the idea. That this is treated as an oopsie. Well, if you think that you're not going to rip her apart and make her permanently disabled and permanently ostracized from society and damage her hideously, if you think that your intercourse won't do that, go ahead. Now, there's still a chance that it might. There's still a chance that you might make that oopsie. But women are such trash. They are valued so little that doing that to a little girl. And you can imagine what's happening to her yeah. when that's happening, that she's screaming and crying as she's being ripped apart. This would be more painful than childbirth. For all of you women who had unmedicated childbirth, far less painful, because guess what? You don't tear that much at all, unless it's like a really horrific labor. You just don't tear that much. No. Far, but far, far more second. violent and painful. He is that. sitting on top of her, doing that to her until yes. he tears her apart. But and this is an Islamic there. law. I know, this is horrific. But Palestine says none of this is true. None of this is in the Quran. There's a lot of things that are not in the Quran, like the five daily prayers is not in the Quran. How to pray is not in the Quran. The Quran is an incomplete document. In fact, in terms of the Sharia, it's effectively irrelevant. It has been superseded by the Sharia. It's been superseded by the Fiqh. Now, he says this is in the Talmud. This is not. None of this is in the Talmud. I, I know Absolutely people not. Argue. People are going to argue with me about that, and you're happy to come on, and I will humiliate and embarrass you personally. But on that point, um, no, this is the Fiqh, Palestine. This is your Islamic law. This is legal. This is righteous. This is supposedly moral. This is Islam. Deal with it. Let's continue. 
Ooh, so before, if, before, yeah. before you do, I want to make a quick comment. I actually agree with Palestine. None of this is true. But it's not true because it is immoral, disgusting, gross behavior. It is taught by Islam. So if this is immoral behavior, it's because Islamic the Islamic scholars who created these laws, the same people who passed on the Quran, the same people who passed on the Hadith, the same people that you fall, must rely on to follow Islam were liars, disgusting, immoral people who invented this crap that you rightfully recognize as crap, but you still follow everything else they taught you. They have to, they have to own this. This is Islam. This is the true face of Islam. This is, this is why Sharia is a secret. This is why it is treason for them to reveal this. That's why, of course, once his face dropped off. Now, I'll continue. So, if there is a fear that the vaginal tissues will tear to such an extent that the vagina and anus will virtually come together, then by the insertion of the glands of the penis into a vagina, ab ablution will become obligatory on the man if he has reached the age of puberty. Notice this applies to boys as well. Boys can also be underage. However, if there is the aforementioned fear in a very minor goal, notice they make a distinction between minor and very minor. And when they say very minor, they mean infants in the cradle. Do not get me wrong here. They mean infants in the cradle. Then the mean insertion, blah, blah. I, I think you get this. And then finally, ablution is obligatory fad, on both of them if both are mature. Alternatively, it will be obligatory on the one who is mature. And this is an encyclopedia of Islam dealing in a very simple way with the tenets and principles to practice Islam in day-to-day -day life. And let's continue. A final uh, one. Uh, uh, yeah. Real quick, before you do that, I wanted to bring this up. Um, Palestine says he's finished and he'll be back later, just like his buddy yes. Safraz. As soon as the, it got real, he had to leave. Yep, yep. I'll finish with this and we'll go back to our topic. Notice infant wife adultery. So a man can be punished for accusing his infant wife of cheating on him by sleeping with another man. When I say infant, I mean a child is a year old. Okay, understand that. And of course, the court will say, look, it's impossible for your one year old wife to cheat on you with another man. She could not have done it voluntarily. So therefore, you are at fault for, for blaming her. You're just trying to get out of this marriage. So notice a husband who accuses his wife of adultery is disciplined. When adultery is impossible, such as when the person accused is a mere infant. Remember, they define infant as a baby in the cradle. So understand, this is law in Islam. This is considered righteous. This is considered holy. Uh, fi any final word, Thaddeus and uh, Mary, before uh, I continue? Well, uh, Safraz just re-entered the stream here. Oh, very convenient. Uh, goodbye. My internet's just uh, crashed today. My internet's crushed. I was out. I was out. I've just, I've just re come home. Hey, no, no problem. We'll be happy to go back to what Islam mm -hmm. QA says. Was it, was it Islam yes. QA? You, you suggested we look at Islam QA, so we're going to go back there. Because you, you told us that what we're telling you isn't taught by Islam, that the scholars uh, of Islam QA, for example, disagree with what we're saying. Yeah. Sadly yeah. for you, Safraz, the scholars agree with me and disagree with you. They said exactly the opposite of what you've said. Go on, so. So in, in this fatwa on Islam QA, why is Islam a marry, why is it allowed in Islam to marry girls below the age 10 without, without their permission? Can you justify this ruling of child marriage? And the answer is that marrying a young girl before she reaches the age of adolescence is permitted in the Sharia. Now these scholars, of course, they believe in the Sharia, even if you don't. And there was scholarly consensus. There was ijma on this point. So all of the schools of fiqh, all of the founding fathers of Islam, they all agreed that this adolescence marriage, pre-adolescent marriage, pre-pubescent marriage is legal. And it states here, Quran 65, 4, and it says a girl who does not have periods because she is young and has not reached puberty, right, because she is immature, right? So it yeah. says here, those who have no courses, they are still immature, in other words, still before puberty. This indicates yeah. that Allah has made prepubescent marriage a valid marriage. And they talk about the hadith of Aisha, where she was six years old. And it yeah, states yeah. here, if the, if the husband and the guardian of the girl agree upon something that will not cause harm, then they may have, well, you may agree, the husband may have sex with this girl. And Abu Bait said, once a girl reaches nine, 
the marriage may be consummated without her consent. This is called marital rape. Now, there is nothing in the Hadith of Aisha to set an age limit or to forbid that in the case of a girl who is able for it before the age of nine. So even according to Islam QA, prepubescent sex is legal. So explain to us why this is moral, why this pedophilia is considered good and holy no, in Islam. My, my argument is, yeah, that Quran goes with the Torah. They're both the same, you see, for, for me, yeah. And this was happening a lot at that time. But this is 2002. This is the 21st let, let him finish, century. Right. Let, let him finish. No, I know that. But what I'm trying to say to you, this law was was agreed upon in the Quran and in, in and in the Torah by God, yeah. But you're not gonna find that. Ha you're, you are not gonna find this happening now. It does not. It does. It does not happen. So, now. Safras, what what you're telling us then is that people are more moral than the commands of your God. It's not. It's not. It's not that because at that time there were adding kids. It, anyway. This, it was just this article was written in two thousand and two. What's that? It, this article on Islam QA yeah. that we're looking at right now yeah. is written in two thousand and two. You suggested we go to this source. We yeah. we go to it. It's written two thousand and two. Are you saying that child marriage was okay in two thousand and two, but it's no longer okay in in two thousand twenty two? No, they they are seen they are seen in in this uh, website. They're saying that it is okay according to the laws. But what I'm trying to say to you, yeah. Even if it, even if it was okay, yeah, it does not happen now. It's rare. You're not gonna find it happening. So I I'll agree. I'll concede that point. That that is true. It is rare. Most people are not interested in having sex with children. Well, it, that's not the point. The, the how common it is is irrelevant. What what is relevant here is that your God says this is allowed, and you told us that it was immoral. So which is it? Is it allowed and moral and people just choose not to do it? Or is it immoral and inappropriate? For me, uh, for me, uh, it, it is not an oral, not, it's not, it's not an oral for this time. This is what I'm saying to you. 2002, not, it was okay. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Even, even the, even the, even the Jews will agree with this. So when, when, when a caliphate is formed, is this the law? So far as when a caliphate is formed, is this the law? What's that? This? No. Well, actually, I'll make a statement. This is Islamic law. This will be the law under a caliphate. This will be legal no under an Islamic caliphate. There's no country that will put this in, in, into, the, into the law. There's no... Really you want Sharia for no. Britain, don't you? This no. is the Sharia. No, but it will never happen. You know that. Okay, so basically, so basically you're saying that it's okay, it's okay that Islamic law is evil because no one today is so insane that they would do the evil things that Islamic law says are fine. But actually, if you go to Yemen, for example, a girl was raped to death by her husband, a little bitty tiny girl, and died, and they were going to put in, because she was very young, they were going to put in a legal age of marriage. And when that happened, there were enormous uh, riots of people saying that, no, it is un-Islamic to put in this age of marriage. So it wasn't passed. So you're wrong. There were people who, looking at a little girl who had died because of what her husband did to her, they said that that is better than putting in a law because the law is un-Islamic and her dying is unfortunate, but just something that you have to allow to happen sometimes to be able to have correct Sharia law. Yeah, but these are war-torn countries. They're following Islam. So, now you're saying that Islamic law is wrong and that you people shouldn't me. follow it. Okay, okay, okay. You, you show me where this is happening in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, UAE, Egypt. <laughs> it is happening in Egypt, sweetheart. What it, what's happening with the Misyar marriages in Egypt? Little girls are having up to 60 husbands. 60, 60, 60 husbands by the time they are adults. All you have to do is type in Miss Your Marriage uh, Children Egypt and you will find tons of articles covering these tiny little girls who are sold into uh, sex slavery over and over and over again 
to their Miss Yar marriage Sunni husbands. So the question is about the question is about Islamic law and whether or not Islamic law allows it. Now, Lloyd has shown you over and over again that Islamic law absolutely allows this. And all you can say is, yeah, but nobody's going to do it. Nobody's going to do it. And people are doing it. And you're like, well, they're doing it there, but they're not going to do it somewhere else. So you're okay with little girls being raped to death. Raped to death is okay with you. Well, I'm trying to because say, you just like think that it isn't happening in certain countries. Some countries, some Islamic countries, nominally Islamic countries, aren't doing Kinda, what what Sharia law says they should. So Kinda, do, here is my question, Safraz. Do Kinda. you want Sharia or not? Yes or no? Do you want Sharia? Kinda. What's that? Okay. The, do let, you want let, Sharia? Let him, let yes him or answer, no? Mary. Let him answer. Yeah. Go ahead, Safraz. I'm saying that the laws that Saudi Arabia have got today, Dubai have got, these laws are good for me. Strict laws like that. So, so, you, so do you not want to hear that? So, Safras, you said that this wasn't happening in Egypt. It took me all of, and Egypt was the first country I looked for. I can, I'm no doubt can find cases in Saudi Arabia too, but 117,000 children under the age of 18 are currently married in Egypt. And there is currently April 2022, an effort to pass a law to forbid these kind of marriages. And there is opposition against it from, guess what? Fundamentalist Muslim clerics who say that this is against our laws. This is a, putting a minimum age for marriage is against our religious beliefs. So again, the question for you is, do you support these fundamentalist Islamic clerics, such as those on Islam QA that you told us to go and look what they have to say? Or do you believe in the law of Safras, that Safras decides what is good? Uh, I, I fully, I am 100% certain that you personally would not marry a child. But that doesn't mean there aren't other adult men who would marry a child. So should it be illegal for them or should it be legal like it has traditionally been in Islamic law? For me, uh, it cannot be happening. It cannot be happening uh, to again at a uh, really young, young age. It is not. Well, it is happening. So it, it really doesn't matter if it's too offensive for you to imagine people would do it. People will do it. So should there be a law forbidding it? But or but should the you, law allow it and each person make their own moral decision? But Teddy Osi, yeah, you have to understand this here. Yeah, these girls, I cannot see these girls even agreeing to it. They're getting forced into it. This is wrong. Uh, you can't force of course they're, they're being forced into it. A, as the text that Lloyd read you from Islam QA says, the no, guardian no. makes the decision. They're, no, no, no. Uh, there was a hadith. There's a hadith saying that there was a... We're not interested. A, no, Safraz, we're not interested in your... In your dissimulation, no, we're no, not no, interested in the abrogated hadith. We are discussing the fifth. We will talk about the fifth. There's a well known Islam hadith Kiway where... Kiway tells us that this is legal. The girl can be forced into it against her will. She, she doesn't no need to consent. There's no we have, so, so we Safra... have just made this clear to you. I can show you from it's, I can show you from the same website. I can show you from the same website is Islam QA where it shows you. Ibn Taymiyyah, the biggest scholar around, saying that you cannot force a girl. Islam QA. Is that that the okay, what, what is, is the question the number or the topic no. name? Let, let's find it. Let's see what they say. Uh, just, because I, I don't trust you, Sam, friends. I, I'm okay. sorry. You okay. you ra repeatedly make up stuff. Okay. Okay. And then when we show you what the source actually says, then you're like, that source doesn't okay. matter to me. So The thing is, yeah, I can't, I can't, so is this moral to you? Is this moral? Yes, no. Do you support this? Yes or no? For me, no, no, you can't force anybody. You can't force a little girl. This is, so, so are so, you saying that Islamic law is immoral? No, I can't access my internet. Okay, so let, 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 let's just, for the sake of argument, say you're correct. And that the guardian doesn't control the, make the decision for the child. Can you tell me, think about a, a small child, you know, someone age six, someone age eight, someone age 10. If their father tells them to do something, do you really think they're going to say, no, I won't do that? 
Do you really think they have the ability to consent? Do you think a six-year-old has the ability to give informed consent for marriage? Well, the, the, the girl will, will be happy, obviously. She will not be happy. Any young girl will not be happy to get uh, six. Yeah? Actually, young girls often fantasize about getting married. Uh, six years old. Yeah, it's quite common for children to play pretend to be married because they, they view that they, for example, the example of their parents, they see their parents married. They, they don't act, of course, they don't understand what that entails, but children are, try to imitate their parents. They look at their parents and say, oh, my parents are very happy. They're married. I want that for myself. I want to, to get married. So again, I ask you, can a six-year-old give informed consent? Let's say that for the sake of argument, you're wrong, but let's say for the sake of argument that it, the child's consent is required. Can a child actually consent? Can a child actually understand what it means to get married at age six? To be honest, yeah, the girl doesn't have a clue what Ali is at six years old, to be honest. Okay. I, I agree. So then there should be a minimum age for marriage. Do you, according to you, not according to Islamic law, but according to you, the child should have to have reached a certain age where they can make an informed decision for themselves and they should have to be able to give consent. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They cannot be forced. They cannot be no one can be forced to get to agree. Islamic law makes mm -hmm. that legal though. So now no, we know that Islamic this is, is not this is everybody. this is perfectly legal within Islamic law and I'm happy to discuss we can take a separate occasion and go through the laws of marriage. Now, uh, notice here, you had discussed... it up on this. Hey, Lloyd, you had it up on the screen earlier. I don't remember if it was Islam QA or one of your sources, but it specifically said that the the guardian can force the child into marriage. No, yes, no. they may. Yes, it, that, that is true. The guardian can do that. And also, if she the is, guardian, yeah, if she is prepubescent, especially that that is the case in which marriage. So a virgin a sense generally by her silence so the first marriage of a girl she never virtue she never speaks to whether or not she's a child or an adult she does not say i want to marry this man because her silence is considered a sin and secondly if she arranges her own marriage she is called an adulteress by muhammad so if she chooses her own her own partner the the virgin who mar who arranges her own marriage is an adulteress according to muhammad that is a direct quote from sahih sources and furthermore if she is a prepubescent child then the islamic law says that her she has no consent anyway so that decision is made completely by her guardians yes, that's the islamic law can, the guardian and the husband can decide that that she can be used for his sexual pleasure without her consent, as we have up on the screen right here. This is from Islam QA. So this is consistent with all of the Islamic law texts. I mean, maybe let me show Safraz the rest. Safraz, this is consistent yeah. across all of these Islamic law manuals. They speak here of a rupture of a young child. We're talking an infant, someone who's a minor, prepubescent, the tearing of the per peritoneal wall between vagina and rectum. This is because the adult has destroyed the body of a minor child. And it says here that the minor child doesn't have to have chusl because she's too young. Notice it says here that if, a, if you have sexual intercourse with a minor girl, the minor girl does not have to have the chusl. She doesn't have to purify herself. It speaks of if a woman is underage, but not so small that if one is intercourse with her, there is fear of the vaginal tissues tearing. Now, these are books that are used and read by millions and millions, tens of millions of Muslims. This is standard Islamic fiqh. This is the same across all the schools of fiqh, every single one. They speak of fear in a very minor goal. A very minor goal, you need to, if you're, if there is the aforementioned fear, then insertion of the penis does not make the pussel obligatory, the purificatory bar obligatory. But it says here minor goals and very minor goals. And it says that, so this is Islamic law. Now, why do Muslims not simply admit that this is what is in the Sharia? In the uh, welcome to the stream, Golden Age Islam. Oh, never mind, they dropped back out. Okay. Hello. 
Why do all the yeah, scholars yeah. say this? Every single scholar of the madhabs mm. all say this. Uh, the only thing is, yeah, the only thing I believe in and what I've read in the hadiths is, yeah, that no girl can... We're not interested in the hadiths. We're, the hadiths, the ijma. We are interested in the ijma. This is the no, Islamic no, no, law. No. This is... We, we, we go through Quran and... No, no, Safraz, so you, you are you are at the Ibarra level of Islam. That is the lowest level of knowledge, the absolutely lowest level of knowledge. The only the things you are permitted, knowledge. the only things you are permitted are the Quran and some hadith. This is the scholars. We, you always say, consult a scholar. I have consulted the scholars. This is the word of the scholars. Your imams go to study for seven years at seminary yeah. to learn this stuff and do this in court. <laughs> this is what they have in court. So explain to me why all of your most highly trained imams, the best imams who have ever lived, all of them agree that this is correct Islamic law. One of the highest scholars of Islam is called Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah. He says, he says it straight that no girl can be forced into what, marriage. What is the text? What is the text? Where do we find it? Is this the um, Ijma? Is this Ijma? Was he one of the founding Imams? Because he is a Sheikh al Islam, but he is not at the level of the Hujat. He's not at the level of the Mujtahid's Mutlaq. He is not a Mujtahid Mutlaq. So we're talking about the Mujtahid's Mutlaq. This is the Ijma, the consensus. Where in the consensus does it disagree with this? Let me see, let me see, wait, wait. Uh, Force into sleeping with the living. Why, why the, Safras uh, is looking for that reference? Uh, there was a a comment here asking us to clarify the difference between underage girls and above nine. I'm not 100% sure if this is what he meant, but I did want to point it out either way, that the, the fic here is making a distinction. It says women underage, which is very kind of self-contradictory there, but it distinguishes this group from very minor girls. So you have minor females who are underage, you know, say perhaps between the age of 10 or 12 and 17 and then you have very minor girls it, it 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 recognizes there's a distinction but the distinction isn't you're allowed to have sex with so, one you're so allowed to how is this beautiful? another so for us how is this beautiful how is the rape of a three-year-old a two-year-old five-year-old how is this beautiful please explain this is your law i'm actually so reading Surprise, how yeah. is this beautiful? You, you have told me Islamic law is beautiful. How is this beautiful? For me, uh, for me, what I've read... How is this beautiful? From, no, I'm, 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 I'm giving the highest scholar in history. Ibn Taymiyyah is one of the highest scholars in history. Ibn Taymiyyah is a Sheikh al-Islam. He's he one of the scholars. below the Mujtahid's mm -hmm. Mutlaq, who are the four scholars who founded the schools of Fiqh, and above them sits Al-Ghazali, who is the Hujjat, the proof of Islam. So I know exactly the status of Ibn Taymiyyah. He's the expert on jihad. He's the one that all turn to when they want to learn about the laws of jihad. And of no, course, he... Sab al-Rasul, which is insulting Muhammad. And of course, he's also one of the major founders of the polemics against Christianity. I happen to know this better than you do. So explain to me why this is beautiful, because this is the ijma. This is the consensus Islam. of all the schools of fiqh. Well, I'm going through Islam and therefore Ibn Taymiyyah's written references and, the, and he's then it straight is you cannot force a girl we're not interested in ibn Taymiyyah's uh, opinion uh, okay we, we already said we already discussed forcing or not forcing and i already said even if that is the case that it's still okay. equally disgusting yeah. so, uh, just, so uh, uh, i i have something point. relevant let's 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 talk about ibn Taymiyyah here let's see what islam qa says about his about what a father can do about a little bitty girl who's underage okay so so let, let's look at some of these various quotes for example uh it is permissible for a man to arrange a marriage for his young son even if he's not permit permit reach puberty it's also permissible for him to arrange for his young daughter even if she is not reach age of permit of uh the age of puberty, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it says that, oh gosh, it scrolled up. Um, okay. Sorry, okay, I'll find Ibn it in Taimiyya. just a second. So yeah, it's, he's got some so, great ones. Thank you. So this is Ibn Taymiyyah while we're at this. This is the unsheathed sword against the one who insults Muhammad. 
Okay, this is Ibn Taymiyyah's. This is the fiqh, the Sharia law on insulting Muhammad. It states here. So, Safraz, you agree with this, right? Murdering non-Muslims who insult Muhammad. Whoever insults the Prophet is to be killed, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim. Killing is prescribed on him who insults Muhammad, and it is not permissible to imprison or show favor to him or ask to ransom him. Any Muslim or non-Muslim who insults Muhammad is to be killed. No repentance is sought. Let's continue. <laughs> right? Now, this is Ibn Taymiyyah, one of the greatest authorities. You just told us he's a major authority in Islam. Whoever insults Muhammad is to be killed, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. This is the general view of the scholars. This is the ijma. The scholars have consensus. The ijma again, that whoever insults Muhammad is to be killed. Malik, Laith, Ahmad, Ishaq. So this tells us that Muslims have unanimous agreement killing whoever insults Muhammad. You agree with these rules of murdering people who don't believe that Muhammad is perfect? Should be... We're, we're... Yes or no? Put it up again. Put that. Yes or no? Page up again. Put that page up again. Look, read it. Whoever insults the prophet is to be killed, whether they are Muslim. Well, he said that. He said that anyway. But phew. do you agree with this? You've just told us he is one of the greatest authorities in Islam. You've just told us. So this is him. Do you agree with this? This is the Ijma. He is referencing the founders of the four schools of fiqh. So do you stand? <laughs> with murder for people who non-muslims and muslims who criticize muhammad well uh, yes well no? how do you know how how do you know that's not talking about in a in a muslim country muslims so, or so, non uh, a muslim country so we, 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 we let, let's review here we read you sharia you say don't read me that get islam qa we go to no, islam no. qa you say don't give me islam qa give me Ibn Tamiya. Ibn Tamiya. We go to Ibn Tamiya, and and you say, well, he doesn't really mean what he says. So no, who can mean, we go to, Tafras? Who can we actually saying, look at? He's saying, he's saying here, whether whether in, in so the prophet is to be killed, whether they are Muslim or disbeliever, he could be talking about in the in in the Arab world. Whether and whether so he might be. Prove us wrong. Prove me wrong. Show me yeah. the evidence that it's otherwise. Remember, because we know, for instance, take Samuel Paty was killed in France, right? Think of the number of people killed in Nigeria. Think of the number of people killed in the Philippines. Think of the people murdered in Holland by Muslims because they insulted Muhammad. Think of the number of people killed because of the cartoons in Denmark and other I places. Believe, this I happens believe. all over the world. So tell me, do you stand, do you agree with murder? of non-Muslims and Muslims who believe Muhammad is not perfect. Well, I well I believe if anybody insults a prophet in one of them countries, I think, yeah, they're causing corruption in the land, d deal with them. So kill them? Only in a Muslim land. So what define deal with them, because this is your law. See, this is your Islamic law. This is yeah. black and white Ibn Taymiyyah. It says to kill Muslims and non-Muslims. The country is not defined. They do speak about dhimmis, but they call that a separate category that is non-Muslims living in an Islamic land. So this refers to Muslims and non-Muslims globally. Why do you it support this? Say, How is this does, good? Does, How, why should we like this? Why should we think it's great? It does not say he is globally. This could be in the Arab world. Oh, okay, <laughs> fine, Safras. Let's, let's just say for argument that it only applies in Islamic countries. The question is, how is this beautiful? How is this a good thing? Let, let's just say you're correct and it only applies in Muslim majority countries. How is it a beautiful thing to kill someone for insulting Muhammad? Because in the, in the Quran, Allah says, if anybody causes corruption in the land, should be killed. And these so, people... That so, are... so that is what the basis of the law is. And no yeah. doubt that is one of the many things the scholars will cite, but that isn't the question. The question is, is how is this beautiful? Yeah. Are you saying it's beautiful because Allah says it is? Are you saying that Islamic law? So what you're telling us then is this statement is meaningless, that Islamic law is beautiful. That's a meaningless statement because what you're saying is it's Islamic law because Allah says it is, and it's beautiful because Allah says it is. So there, you have said absolutely think, nothing when you've said Islamic law is beautiful. I think if if I believe anybody insults a prophet in one of them Arab lands, anybody comes out in public insulting him, 
This doesn't talk they about do. Arab lands only, Safras. This yeah, does not mention that. In Arab lands, they speak of dhimmis only. So, yeah, but, unfortunately, your statements are not valid. The, so, why is this beautiful? The, the, the scholars say today, the scholars say that you should follow the laws of the land. But so, 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 Safras, yeah. uh, are the laws of the land superior to Allah's laws? That's what you're telling me. What's that? Are the laws created by human beings, the laws of the land, superior to Allah? You told me Islamic law is beautiful. Now you're saying the scholars of Islam say to follow the secular law instead. So no. are you saying that Muslims should follow secular law because it is superior to the law of Allah? And the law of Allah is not beautiful? Is that what you're telling me now? No, I'm not. I'm not saying that. They're saying that, that for example, if you live in the USA, you have to... Follow them. Where is this? Right. Where is this Ijma ruling? Where, where is this Ijma ruling? Please show me the fifth manual that says this. If you cannot, I'm willing to tell you you are lying to me. I want to see the fifth ruling from the Ijma. Well, I've got no. Well, I've got no uh, details now, me. I'm okay. Well, I'm giving so, you. So, Safras, so that's so. fine. You don't have to have everything off the cuff. That's fine. Here's what. Here's what you're going to do. Yeah. You're going to go research that, and then. Before you leave any other comment in the comments, we want a source for that claim. Anything else you say will be ignored or deleted. We want a source for your claim. You you just claimed it's in Islamic law. You don't have it with you. That's fine. You know, I don't expect you to have memorized all of the law. I don't expect you to know every source off the top of your head. But you're saying that this is true. So your first comment in the comment sections of this video better either be a source or an admission that you can't find that and you don't actually have any basis to believe that will, is what Islamic will, law teaches. I will get you, hopefully, I'll get you stuff and then I'll, uh, once I have it, I'll uh, either give it to all of you through comments, yeah? So, Perfect. are your Perfect. scholars wrong, Safras? Are your scholars wrong? The Mujtahid's Mutlaq, are they wrong? What? Are these laws what? incorrect? Which ones? The ones the that, so, so you're saying, let me clarify for Safras. So Safras, you've said that Islamic scholars teach to mm -hmm. follow the laws of the land. Mm -hmm. Lloyd has pointed out numerous Islamic scholars who are saying these are the laws you should follow. So his question for you now is, are the scholars he's quoting wrong? Are these scholars uninformed about the higher ruling that you should follow secular law? Can uh, you show me, Lloyd, where any scholars say that you are uh, you have to uh, you have to follow Islam, even you you have to follow the laws Why of Islam. Why don't you show me? I've just showed you the law, so you've got to show me that no. I'm wrong. No, I'm I'm saying to you that there are scholars saying that that if you live in a, another country, like a Christian country or ijma? Jewish country, is this in the fifth? Yeah. Is this ijma? Is this no. the consensus? No. You have all of the laws. You, you can't Give me the name of the manual the that I need to look in. Show us the ruling. And, and Safras will do that in the comments. So let's, let's just, for the sake of continuing the conversation, um, pretend that Safras has a point here, that, oh, that, that these laws on, yep. only apply to Muslim countries. The yep. question remains, even in Muslim countries, how are these beautiful laws? How are these good laws? How is this a law coming from a just God? These laws are not just in the Quran, it's, it's even in the Torah where God is saying, Well, Allah schemes against me, kill him. How many this people have the Jews killed? Yeah. So, we lost two so are, are you telling us that the Torah is the authority? That anything no. in the Torah is automatically beautiful? Because I'm asking you why these laws are good or why they're beautiful. And all you can tell me is Allah said them and Allah said them in the Torah as well. Because because they are causing corruption in the in the land. So we're not saying yes. He's land. saying he's saying yes. He supports this. So he's actually in agreement with. So I, well, I no, he I said he said explicitly he supports the laws. That's not what I'm getting at. I'm asking him why these are good laws, and he seems to only be able to say they're good because Allah gave them. You strict laws it, that it will, it will it will keep the country. So he agrees these laws are correct. So this is Islamic law. So why do Muslims lie about Islamic law? Why do they lie when it's very clear in your fifth text that yeah. pedophilia, murder for apostasy, murder for insulting Muhammad are all perfectly legal. Even lying is 100% legal and not only legal in Islam, 
lying in Islam, according to your fiqh, is obligatory upon Muslims. Lying no. is obligatory. Yes, it is. Now, look, we've already proven from your fiqh, from the words of your scholars, Islam Q included, everything I say is factual. You yeah. have not provided any evidence except your opinion. Lying is 120% legal in Islam. In fact, it is obligatory for you to lie. Lloyd, I, I gave you two hadiths on the other channel where... The hadiths do not Muslims matter. That is not oh, Ijma. Bukhari. Bukhari hadith that's Da'if oh, Bukhari. Those, those, those hadiths are Da'if. Yeah, he, Bukhari is not Bukhari my scholar. I Bukhari is not my scholar. He's, those are Da'if high... hadiths. But no, we have, we're talking about higher authority. Is, is Safa... a higher authority. Oh, Safas, let me clarify what Lloyd is doing here. He's playing the yeah. same game that, that Muslims do. He, that when we quote Hadith, you say that's not a reliable Hadith. When we quote a scholar, you say that's not my scholar. So he's playing your game. I give him two. Well, not only that, but but the ijma the ijma determines what Islamic law is. So you, once yeah. there's ijma on something, it doesn't matter if there are minority uh, ahadith that contradict it. It does not matter that other things exist because the scholars already knew about this. They weighed it all when they made their determination. So he was running to Ibn Taymiyyah on child marriage, guess what Ibn Taymiyyah said? He said that at the age of nine, the consent of the girl is required, which means that under the age of nine, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, you don't need consent. All he was saying is that once a girl turns nine, she requires consent. And you think that that's actually going, proving your point in some way? No, that's insane. Sharia. The Sharia states, so far as notice, the Sharia, the Fiqh states, non-mujtahids are of no consequence. Uh, just, just swap back for a second, Thaddeus. Oh, yep, the rule states that the opinion of a non-mujtahid is of no consequence. Are you a mujtahid, Safras? What does that uh, mean? I don't know what that means. Are you a mujtahid? Are you a jurist? Are you a highly trained legal jurist in Islam? Are you a trained imam, no, 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 trained no. scholar? No, no, no. No. So it says here, non-mujtahids are of no consequence. All mujtahids mm. in the period of the thing agree on its ruling regardless of their country, race, or group. Regardless of country, regardless of race, regardless of group. Country does not matter. And non-mujtahids, like you, are of no consequence. So all that matters, according to the ijma, is the ijma. Yeah. So your views yeah. do not matter. Thanks, study, so you can switch out. Yeah, I so this... Believe. Yeah. What you believe of no consequence? No, no. What, what I was saying to you in uh, Islam, if it if it if it says um, Arid can be taken, you know, your young girls can get married. I know for a fact here yeah, that is is rare in the West. You know, and finer in the West or these other. But I say if if, it, if, it, if it, that's lovely it, rhetoric. We want to see the evidence. I'm showing you. I'm showing you evidence. I'm showing you the. No, it I'm showing you the law. Show Islam. me don't evidence. Think, I don't. We don't think Islam that that you. What do you mean it's not in Islam? Are all the sources we've quoted you not Islamic sources? What you're really saying is it's not something you believe in, which is different than saying it's not something that it, that major scholars of Islam teach. Okay, say, Safaz, talk fear right now. Anyone who says that this is in Islam, talk fear them. Do it. I'm saying to you. I'm saying to you. No, 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 no. Safaz, talk fear. Now, I need to hear your talk fear. Are you going to talk fear them? What's that? Are you going to talk fear anyone who says that this is Islam, that Islam teaches this? Islam says it is okay to marry a young girl. It does agree with it. I know that. It also says it's legal to have sex with infants as young as one year old in the cradle. In fact, there is no yeah. minimum age. There is no minimum age. You pick one year so, old. so thank thank you, Safras, for admitting that this is something that Islam teaches. Now let's get to the... Be, very briefly, I want to touch on Ibn Taymiyyah, who, who you told us that defined the article about him on Islam QA, which we did for you. And here's what he says. If a person has authority to handle the affairs or wealth of another, either as a guardian or by appointment as a proxy, it is not permissible for him to do whatever he wants. He has to choose that which is in his ward's best interest. Now, you claimed that this article would tell us that it requires the minor child's consent. In fact, what he actually said is they have to act in the child's best interest. Is it sometimes in the best interest of the child, according to the guardian's opinion, that they get married even at a very young age? 
I bet it sometimes is. So this doesn't actually say what you claimed it said. What I'm saying to you here, that this, that if it's, if it's, if it's, you know, if it's him telling you that, that, that it's, you know, permissible, but for what I, what I know of, it does not happen at this time. Okay, that's fine. So, so we're now in agreement that this is something that is permissible in Islam. Now we need to address the logical problem of your argument. You're saying that it's rare now. Great. It's very rare. It's very rare for someone to cut off the head of another person in the United States. Does that mean it is irrelevant whether it's moral or not? To call for what? The person's head in the USA? Yes. No. Okay. So so the rarity doesn't determine whether something's moral or not. So why are you making arguments that child marriage is, is rare? Child marriage is rare. It just, it just happens in these African worlds or these poor countries. Fine, fine. It's rare. I, I get that it's rare. That's not that. that it, what I'm telling you is it's irrelevant how rare it is. What we're discussing is whether it's moral or not. So how rare it is is irrelevant. So uh, do you have any, do, no. is it moral? It doesn't matter if it's rare. Is it it's is right. it moral for an adult to marry an underaged child? I'm going to give you two answers here. At that time, it was okay. But at this time, I don't think it is. And the Sharia no. is eternal. No. It is Allah's no. law. Well, it is Allah's you, law. Think, it is eternal. Model for this time. I don't think it's model for okay. this your opinion. That is not right. the fact. Of the this fact is your opinion, Safras. So, it's is your opinion? opinion. What What is the basis of your opinion? What under what is what in Islam tells you that is wrong for today, but it was okay in the eighth century and apparently in the year two thousand and two when the article was written by Islam QA, but not okay today. For For me, uh, if it if it was okay. People will be doing it here in the West, but they're not. Muslims will be people. You mean Muslims will be doing more of it? They are doing it. It does happen. Child cool. marriages do occur wait, wait, wait. in the West. No, no. I want don't don't, yeah. don't go that way, Lloyd. I want I want Safras to think about what he just said. If yeah. if people aren't doing something, it's immoral, and if people are doing something in large numbers, it's moral. That's what he just said. Is that really what you want to say, Safras? That the majority of opinion of peop what people do determines whether something is good or not? Well, I believe the yeah, majority of Muslims will not even do this now. I, I agree 100% that majority of Muslims won't do it. But are you telling me that the majority of Muslims not being interested in disgusting prepubescent sex is what determines that it's immoral? <coughs> Is it no, is it this, just is is that what determines morality? Is it is it the majority of opinion among faithful Muslims that's what determines what's moral and what's immoral? No, what I'm trying to say, Teddy Ossi, is at that time it was just normal. It was it was it was happening anyway. Okay, like, fine. It was the, first of all that's inaccurate. But let's pretend that's accurate. It was normal then, it's not normal now. So was it moral then and not moral now because of that reason? That's what I'm asking you. Is, is the majority opinion about what is normal determine what is moral in Islam? Well, oh, you get me confused here. What I'm saying to you here is not moral now. It's simple. So okay, why, why, why is it not the moral now? Mistake. Because why it, is it not moral now? Because times have changed. So, so the times change, Top changing yeah. changes Allah's eternal law. The God of Islam changes his mind based on what a majority of human beings believe in a given time and place. He's he would say it, yeah, that if uh, you want to do it, you can because it was it was happening at that time. That's why. Look, look, if I if okay, I jump okay, in, look, this is yeah, Safras, yeah, Think about what you're saying here for a minute. You're saying because a lot of people did it, Allah said it's good to do. So what you're saying is that what a lot of people were doing is what determined what Allah decides is good. That's what you're telling well, me. So if a lot of people were eating blue mushrooms, that would be a good and moral thing to do. If not very many people ate blue mushrooms, that would be an immoral thing to do. That's what you're telling me. 
I'm not, I'm not, I'm not telling you that. I'm saying that it was in the scriptures of the Torah and the Quran that is okay at that time because it was happening. So the, so the. Okay, you're, Stephon, you're just going Stephon, in I just have to stop you. I have to stop you right there. Either bring out right now where it says. You can take your penis and stick it inside a prepubescent girl in the Torah or shut up about it being in the Torah because it's not there. So numbers. either bring it right now. No, bring me the, the no, numbers. no, numbers. you are not going there. That does not say you can go and diddle them. It does not say that you disgusting okay. pervert. You are absolutely revolting. Okay. Every time I talk to you, you make me sick. Let me answer. Let me answer. All right, Sapphire, no, no. why don't you give your closing yeah. thoughts? We're kind of just going in a circle here. Yeah, we're just going to. And go I would like so uh, to give Golden Age trying, Islam. So what he's trying to cite is numbers that says that that the girls who were taken in battle will be taken for yourselves. He thinks that means to have sex with because he's a pervert. However, there are. So, however, there are other scriptures that talk about marriage of a woman who is a captive, and she is a woman, not a child, and it is marriage, not captive rape. You are not allowed to rape captive women in Judaism, so don't lie about it. All right, all right, Mary, let's have, Mary Lloyd, everyone, let Sapphire give his final thoughts, and then I'm going to bring Golden Age Islam into this chat, because he might have some more okay. logical thoughts than Safras, who's just going in circles okay. here. Okay, go ahead, Safras. But one more last thing. Thanks for this. I have read biblical commentaries, and I have given you Tedios, and you know that I have given biblical commentaries on Numbers chapter thirty-one, verse eighteen. I have given you about two, three commentaries from biblical sources, which says these girls were were taken as slaves and as and as wives as young little virgin girls i've given you them tedios about a month ago is, is that to... is that your final thought that uh, you you want to claim that numbers is authoritative and that's why islamic laws are good is that your final thought is that where you want to leave us no what i'm saying to you it was it was in the torah and in the quran by the same god who, who, who agreed with it but at this time it is not happening but it was happening at that time in Israel. It was it was happening, and it's happening in Arabia. It was happening in England. King King Richard II, uh, second, he the six years old. Okay, okay, Safras. Yeah, yeah. So, is, is this your final thought then? Is this the yeah, yeah, thought yeah. you want to leave us on that child marriage used to be common, so it was okay. It's not common today, so it's no longer okay. Is that the your final thought? For me, uh, for, for me, Teddy. Because I'm just uh, trying to summarize your argument yeah, for us. Yeah, my argument is, yeah, it was happening so much there around the world, but at this time today, is rare. So Muhammad's example is no longer valid. So Muhammad's example what? has now expired, no, and now it's wrong. It so Muhammad is now time. immoral. But it was happening at that time around so the Muhammad's world. So Muhammad's example was, doesn't. Was, so Muhammad's really? example has expired, and now, now Muhammad's example would be immoral and wrong. It was not his example. It was. It was. Normal Muhammad married a six-year-old. This is now legal in Islam to have young wives who are minors, who are immature, and to have sex with them. Minors it was who are immature. I told you, Teddy, us hundred times. When that's not what we're discussing, so Muhammad's example is now wrong. You're saying Muhammad's example is now immoral. No, no. Uh, all right, Safras, so it's, you know, give us your final, so final thought. So he's lying. So, so Lord, d don't respond to whatever he says. Just let Safras have... His final thought, I just want to clarify what his position is, because I can't even figure out what his position is. So, Sapphire, is your position, and, and you can just answer yes or no, you don't have to restate your position. Is this an accurate representation of your position, that it was very common for people to have young marriages in ancient times, and for that reason, Allah allowed it then, but it's no longer common, so Allah no longer allows it? No, no, no. Okay, if that's not an accurate statement of your position, then please state your position in one sentence like I just did. My statement is, yeah, Allah allowed it in the Torah and in the Quran that it was okay at that time to do it, but it's happening. But if people are not happy with it today, there is no, nothing wrong with it. Don't do it. There's no law which says that you have to do it. No okay, so, so you, have, kids, so you don't have to. 
Okay, I asked you to say it in one sentence. So let me just repeat your idea with slightly different words to make sure I understand you. So your your statement is that Allah allowed this and he never disallowed it, but people are not obligated to do it if they personally find it yes, uh, yeah, offensive. Yeah, yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you for stating your position. So just so everyone's clear, Safaris has agreed with us that it is permitted in Islam, but is not obligatory, and that people should probably follow the local laws, which generally forbid this. So we are in agreement oh. that it is permitted by Islam, but individuals generally won't do this because individuals generally are not as disgusting as no, the God who allows this. Not, Thank so you very much, just, Safra. Look, enough, enough, look, I'd like to get back onto something more. Rational. Yeah, well, I want to... Yeah, so so, so I wanted to... Yeah, if I can look... So Faraz is utilizing a technique in Islam called Adab al-Jadal. It is what they call disputation. What we would call disputation is built on rhetoric and sophistry. It's a very, very sophisticated form of lying. I covered this with Thaddeus in a previous show. Look at our talk on how Islam redefines lying or truth to allow lying. So remember, lying is not only legal in Islam, it is obligatory. So it's a very sophisticated set of rhetorical practices allowing them to lie. But also remember, it's designed to dispute. It's not designed to find truth. It is designed to undermine, to confuse. Within the Islamic law and lying, confusion is considered a benefit to Islam. So therefore, he will want to confuse. So remember, at no point did he give a straight answer. He doesn't give a yes or a no. So this is what is happening. So Palestine, you are lying. So yes, um, that's exactly the case. We've shown that in Islamic law, it is perfectly legal to do all of these things that we discussed. So I'll stop here. Yes, so I wanted to give uh, Golden Age Islam a chance to speak. He joined a while ago and was very patiently waiting for Safras to finish. So I'd like to give him the opportunity to comment now. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, so um, I wanted to make three basic points uh, here. First of all uh, is to explain why uh, what, where his thoughts come from, people like Sir Faraz or generally a lot of Muslims, how they behave and what they understand about the religion. That's one. Uh, number two, why they cannot agree in such an open debate. Um, if, let's say, you're, they're presented with some facts. And number three, I would like to clarify that how actually there is a difference between what Islam says and how actually Muslims live their lives. I myself, uh, I'm an ex-Muslim. So I can shed some light on these three aspects. Excellent. We do, we'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah. So what happens is that um, first first part of the answer is a majority of the Muslims, I think, which is true for every religion, uh, do not know the intricacies of the religion. And that is true for 80 to 90 percent of Muslims, especially those who are born in Islamic countries uh, like myself, um, because you are raised in an environment where you get a very filtered view uh, of the religion. You are always taught the good things. And these fix that Lloyd has been pulling up, uh, these are very, you could say, cryptic, as in, in the sense that people do not have access to these books. Uh, in fact, if you go back, um, there was a time when, you know, printing books was a big problem. And I'm, I, I'm not a believer of any, any religion at this point. But when the printing press came in, it had a lot of impact on Christianity. Sim similarly, Internet uh, is kind of serving that. So the, the point here is most of the Muslims, 80 to 90 percent, do not know of their faith. So, for example, when this information about child marriage or lying, for example, the hiyal and all those things. Get, it's wow, you actually know about hiyal. You know that you're the very first Muslim I've ever heard say that word, the first in years. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It, we are never uh, told about this. So, for example, let me give you an example. Uh, growing up, uh, we never had access to Bukhari or Muslim. Nobody had it. It's just present in the mosques or people who are the top alims. And it, it's like a club. It's like a membership club. So people outside that club do not get access to it. And they only know some parts of it. And so what happens is when you present them, there's a cognitive dissonance that happens. And this is what was happening mm -hmm. with Sir Frost because they're caught in a situation. Now, here's the example. Imagine uh, you are in a situation where a mob or somebody kidnaps your child and asks you to do something. 
you literally have to do it because their life is on the stake. The concept is similar here. It's very hard for any Muslim to really say anything bad or acknowledge even a single bit of badness in the religion or the prophet. No, it's illegal. It's actually illegal. It is treason, yeah. yes. effectively, to reveal the Sharia, the Fiqh. And also, it is illegal to insult Islam. I mean, insulting is yet another extreme. I'm saying even acceptance of a fault cannot... Well, doubt is illegal. Anything that would cause doubt, anything that, that indicates doubt is illegal. Yeah, yeah. So now, the it's that fear, it's that sheer fear of God punishing them that even if logic comes to somebody's head, they cannot accept it. So that's why all this concept of gymnastics comes in. And you know the way, for example, Sir Faz was jumping from one to... And I don't blame him. I don't blame majority of the Muslims for that because they they, they don't know any of these uh, things growing up, uh, especially people who grew up in the West. I mean, I'm from... A, I, I live in the West right now, but I grew up there. Uh, even there, we didn't know. So let alone people who grew up in West. But the third point I wanted to make is... Uh, Sometimes people start associating uh, these teachings with Muslims. And I wanted to say that very clearly here because the audience says it. I, I see that definitely you guys are all Christians. Uh, I would like to request, don't make it against Muslims. Majority of Muslims are better than these laws. The people that you meet in your life, your friends across, they do not marry children. They, they, they abhor it. Like, I, I don't know anybody. Uh, uh, Look, they may not actively be participating, however, they might in the future because they also not actively fighting against it. If I, I could just chime in here, I, I actually agree 100 percent that, you know, 99 percent of Muslims are much better than the laws that their so-called God brings upon them. So I, I agree completely on that. point. So one thing that is important to realize is that all Muslims feel like they need to bring about the state of Sharia and that the world should be brought into Sharia even though they don't really know what's in it and even though personally they might have personal moral disgust at practices of the Sharia they still feel like Allah wants to bring about the Sharia so they will work for something the results of which they would abhor in, in a lot of ways but but also yes, I actually yes, ask I actually ask Muslims all the time, tell me a way in which you personally are morally worse than Muhammad. What evil act have you done that Muhammad has not done? And how are you more of a sinner than Muhammad, who is your perfect example? Because I absolutely believe that the overwhelming majority, 99.99% of Muslims, are better than Muhammad. I absolutely believe that. I would add the the response would be that uh, they do want Sharia because they don't know the complete Sharia. So it's like saying they only know the 10 percent. So they think, OK, this is the good bit and we want it here. They don't know these rulings, these harsh rulings. For example, this underage argument, I am willing to bet if you put it in front of majority of Muslims, first of all, they deny it's a complete denial that this never happened because they are never told that those ahadis, it's, it takes somebody to actually go and read those books, which are not even there. So when they are trying to say, you know, we want Sharia, they don't know these parts of Sharia. So you can't really hold them accountable. It's only those da'is or those top ulema who really know the the the, 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 the other majority is just people thinking, you know. They are the, still a threat are, because they are actively trying to bring about this Sharia state, this caliphate. Yeah. Right, so they're still a threat. They must still be stopped. That's fine. Well, I, I, I'm sure that Golden doesn't think that we should be encouraging people to stay in Islam. <laughs> yeah. So please continue, Golden. I, I'm finding yeah. your perspective very helpful here. Yeah. So uh, I, I would say whenever there is an argument like this, first of all, um, you know, this there is a stages. There's stages. First is denial. Number two is gymnast. Denial because they don't know. Then is when you're presented with these facts, books that you're carrying on. Then, you know, it comes down to which fiqh or madhab you follow. So, for example, this guy was quoting Ibn Taymiyyah, and again, again, whereas Ibn Taymiyyah uh, is a fringe, was a fringe scholar for a huge amount of time. It is just in the last 100 years when all this Islamism came about that Ibn Taymiyyah is tied to this jihad, because in all other fiqh madhabs, Ibn Taymiyyah's standings are considered weak. So, if you follow Shafi, Hanafi, any of that, that is false. That is entirely false. Uh, that Ibn Taymiyyah is, uh, is considered high in all four fiqhs? Is that... This is Ijma. It is standard across all the four schools of fiqh. 
his teachings on jihad are the orthodox standard across you know, all the modernities. Yeah, yeah, you you may you misheard him. He said on things other than jihad. Yeah. He's, he said other than so, for example, yeah. marriage. Or, uh, he's he's writing yeah, yeah, yeah. on Islamic on and Islamic polemics against Christianity are the standard. His writings on Sabah al Rasul are the standard. So unfortunately, no. He's they might claim that they don't like what he says, but they follow it to the letter. No, that. Okay, but, so, but yeah, he was just saying specifically on marriage. But the funny yeah. thing was, the thing is, I, we've all dealt with Sephiroth before, and he just lies about his sources constantly. So he says, oh, Ibn Taymiyyah has this. Well, all Ibn Taymiyyah said is that if a girl is over nine, then she needs to consent by her silence. Exactly. Yeah. That's it! He didn't That's say that if she's under nine, she can't be married off. That was not his position. He just put, because of the various ahadith about a virgin's consent being her silence, well, then sometimes virgins need to be consent. So how old should they be when that happens? Well, it's nine because Aisha was nine when she consented by her silence, according to Ibn Taymiyyah. But he's going to that saying that, oh, you shouldn't marry off any little girls. But even all Ibn Taymiyyah is saying is if she's over nine, she needs to be silent if she's a virgin during her marriage ceremony. Yeah, that's in the Sharia. For that no, to be I her can, I can consent. confirm for yeah. you, if we go into the Reliance and go through the 120 something pages on the laws of marriage, that is in the Sharia. That ruling is fiqh. It is ijma. It is the consensus. Yeah, so, and that was just what I was telling him about. Yeah, that's what I was telling him when he was going to Ibn Taymiyyah. I'm like, Ibn Taymiyyah does not help you here. You're just I, I lying just, about what he says. If I may, but if if I may, does. Palestine, Palestine just says, I don't have time to investigate scholars who are wrong, who are corrupt, who are not Muslim. So now he's just gone and thrown his entire scholarship under the bus. The scholars are wrong. The scholars are corrupt. The scholars are not Muslim. So, which is fascinating. You see, but now these scholars have influenced over a billion Muslims, over a billion. What are you doing, Palestine, to correct these errors? What are you doing to, to warn these over one billion Muslims that have been influenced with fake Islam, with false Islam, by these scholars? What are you doing to tell them the correct Islam? What are you doing to teach them the correct way? Because they've been lied to by your own scholars. So what are you doing? Tell us well, what your efforts are to correct this falsehood of your scholars. Uh, right. Now that he has declared takfir against all scholars of Islam, my curiosity is who in the first 1,000 years of Islam was an actual Muslim? Yeah, nobody well, apparently according to this guy. Uh, yeah, can we, uh, go ahead Sorry, and go go ahead. let's get back to, to what you were telling us about. So what I was trying is uh, Ibn Taymiyyah um, for the last one to 200 years, uh, it has been as, as the Islamist movement arose, He's been a central figure. These people are called, let's say, Salafis or al Hadith. But if you were to sit with Hanafis, or Shafis, who are Muqallid, uh, Lloyd, I, I'm sure you would know that. Uh, Muqallid and Ghair Muqallid. Yeah, Taklid, exactly. So if you were to talk to Hanafis or Shafis, they do not hold Ibn Taymiyyah in legal rulings as a very high scholar. This has only no, started in some legal rulings. They that, deny him in some. Just, very just, just let him go. You're, you're quibbling over minor details. I'd like to. Yeah, exactly. No, no, these like, details actually do matter at the end For of the example, day. For example, and I'll tell you so, uh, Ahl there is a huge fight between people who are called Ahl Hadith in the Indo Pak subcontinent, for example, versus people who are Brailvis or Dubandis. They, they, they do takfir on each other. Uh, the Ahl Hadith quote Ibn Taymiyyah for jihad and some of these rulings and Hanafis of course you are absolutely right it's not for 100% of the rulings but I'm saying like since you said who is the bigger scholar so Ibn Taymiyyah is given less value compared to let's say Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Shafi or Imam Hamad so that is what my position was only so Ibn Taymiyyah is a Sheikh al-Islam is one of the 27 or 28 or 29 depending on which count you take Sheikh yes. al-Islam of the Let's call it the 30 most influential scholars in Islam, yes. whose rulings have become ijma, orthodoxy. However, no, above no, them are the no, four no, mujtahids no. mutlaq, I, right? I, Those I, are the founders I, I, of the schools of fiqh. And then it, above the them, their rulings have become part of the ijma. I didn't say every single ruling, but those rulings have become part of the ijma. Oh. Ibn Tamir's teachings on jihad are 100% legit. They are nasty. I can bring up his books. They are nasty, filthy, violent, and barbaric. Exactly. And they are 100% normal Sunni Islam. They're not, they're not extremist. They are normal Sunni Islam. Mm -hmm. Above the former Jatayid's Mutlaq, who are above the, the Sheikh al-Islam, is Ghazali, the Hujjat. So there's a precedence. Muhammad, Ghazali, 
the four Imams, and then the Sheikh Al Islam, and then a whole bunch of other Muslim scholars. So Ibn Taymiyyah unfortunately holds a very, very powerful place of influence in Islam. If I may here, uh, for example, on the Takfir and Jihad, Ibn Taymiyyah was the first person who introduced the concept of Jihad against Muslims. He said that Muslims, and this is a big, big uh, problem. So, for example, uh, you see these in the last years, you see all these suicide bombings that took place in the Western world, but major, most of them in a higher percentage took place in the Islamic world. The root did that, and I'm just trying to point you towards a area of study where uh, he, he, he has a fatwa that says people who are Muslims, but who have deviated from the true path, jihad is obligatory against them also. Now, this mm -hmm. standing position is against all other four fix of school, and they do not agree with Ibn Taymiyyah on this. This is a big point of difference of jihad. According to all four, jihad does not happen against Muslims. But Ibn Taymiyyah was the one who said, okay, in the modern world, people have left the true feeling, go back to the self, so you need to have jihad against them. There's a huge difference between all other four versus Ibn Taymiyyah on where jihad is applicable. I, so I, just to, just to take a, a quick technical uh, aside here, someone asked to kind of adjust the volumes. There aren't actually any settings in directly in StreamYard to do that. Um, so if Lloyd, if you could bump the volume up a bit on your yeah, end. Yeah, I've just put my good. mic closer to my face and I've turned up the gain. Okay, I've turned, I've moved mine away from my face. Does that help everybody? Yep, yep. You now sound more at the same level. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I just moved my mic. Sorry about that, guys. But I would like to conclude by saying that, uh, again, um, majority of people uh, are better than these harsh rulings. Majority of Muslims that you meet anywhere, even in the Islamic world, uh, they do not want to marry little kids. Uh, they do not want to chop off hands. So whenever the, this debate comes up, just please be objective in terms of uh, being... That may be, but they're also not going to stand against the Ummah when that happens. They're not going to speak out. They're not going to prevent it. They're not going to save you. They are going to support it. Not necessarily. You cannot, you cannot say that about 1.8 billion people. Uh, there are people who want uh, change. There are people who have... That left. may be. However, you don't need... You don't... Look, to take over a country, if you look at the communist revolutions, right, communism is predicated on taking over a country, gaining power violently and holding that power. You don't need more than 3% of a country to follow an ideology to take over a country. 3%. You don't need 90% of the country. 3% is all it takes. So the other 97% are useless, irrelevant, if they don't take action. And they are not taking action. It's fine. I, I, it's fine. But it doesn't mean that 1.8 billion people are bad people. And and yes, I agree 100%. We're talking about, yeah. And just uh, I agree 100 percent. And that's why we're here, actually, uh, at least me personally. You know, I I'm not here because I, I you know, hate Islam or I want to make fun of people. I'm here because I believe that the vast majority of Muslims are victims of the religion, that they they are people who want to be good. They're people who want to seek after God. But they're trapped in a system that doesn't allow them to actually understand what that means, that they're trapped in a system of rituals as opposed to a system of morality. So I agree 100 percent that that, you know, the vast majority of Muslims, you know, 99 percent or more uh, are better than their religion, that they 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 are very that you know they're they're decent people no, who don't they're also in denial believe about in these things but but, but lloyd, lloyd is also correct that you know that these are people who they they don't have any power to stand up against the people in control necessarily but they're also in full denial they will and, and, and the most, truth, most they are will ignorant deny. just like golden age said you know most people are very most muslims are very ignorant of this and that's not unique to islam that's not necessarily an insult on, on islam in and of itself i mean most people but whether also, look, the, the, whether problem is, the problem is we are viewing horrible. Islam as a religion. It is not. Islam does not define itself in its own sources as a religion. Islam defines itself as a political system very similar to communism or fascism or Nazism. It, it is very much a totalitarian political system in its there's, own there's no, definition. There's no disagreement there. There's no disagreement there. That's, that's absolutely you're right. Yeah. But, uh, for example, Muslims suffer a lot more because of the... Let's, let's take the case of women in Islamic countries. Now... 50% of the population, that's women. And they have to go through all these problems. Now, if you were to argue that 
uh, who who is facing more uh, trouble because of that? Is it Western women who face more problem because of Islam, or is it Muslim women who face more problem because of Islam? So my answer would be that's 900 million women who face persecution at the hands. And, of and, and I agree. And like I said, that's why you know that's why I'm doing this is because I want to make a difference. I mean, I'm not delusional enough to think that, that I can reach 900 billion people or 900 million people by any means. But I, you know, I'm here because I want to make a difference because. I actually do care about, about the fate of Muslims, and I believe that they're they're victims of this religion by and large. Yeah. One of the most revolting things that I had discovered whenever I was just learning about why people stay with this awful system is that a lot of Muslim women in the East honestly believe that Western women are being forced to walk around in less than complete covering in order to be attacked and raped because they can't imagine that you can just live your life in shorts and a t-shirt or just regular pants and a short sleeve shirt or running clothes and go out and run and not be in danger and not live your life subjected to these kind of activities and behaviors and, ev and everything. So they imagine that the Western, because Islam specifically teaches that the best people of all are Muslims. And of course, the very best of the Muslims were the uh, Salafs, right? So they honestly think that they're the people around them, that whenever they are in danger going outside, if they took off you know, their hijab, they would be in danger in a lot of places. You cannot just walk around as a woman with your face showing and your hair showing and your elbows showing without being well, in danger. And they assume that everyone else is in danger too. They think that all the other taught. women are being attacked. No, they've also been taught that we are filthy, that we are dirty, immoral, and evil. And they've been taught this since they were four or five years old when they started going to madrasa. They are, the, the well is poisoned, so they already think from the beginning that everything we do is dirty. So unfortunately, this indoctrination, and they believe that all of this evil is correct, is right. The moral system has been so warped in so many cases. Otherwise, why would they have to deceive? There's also, unfortunately, that. So there's the, there's the rose-colored glasses, and there's the fact that these people have also been heavily indoctrinated into this evil and see it as good. Islam is the pinnacle of uh, sargony. All religions have misogyny, and you guys might disagree because you have a certain belief system, but uh, that's the root. That's actually a very central figure in any religion to control the woman. So, I mean, and Islam is like the pinnacle of that ideology. Well, let's turn to what it says about women in the Bible and the creation of women. I'm sure you can so, go back to my original presentation. Yeah, oh, sorry well, about that. Well, uh, we'll, we'll we'll do your original presentation a different day, Lloyd. <laughs> we'll we'll uh, we'll restart from the beginning. I think we weren't very far in, so we'll just restart from the beginning rather than having this long side conversation in the middle. Uh, but I think this is good. I, I you know maybe I'll I'll uh, chop off that first portion and just make this uh, a Muslim declares the the beauty of the Sharia law or something along those lines because I think it was a very good discussion. What did we get out of that discussion? I mean, what did the audience get out of that discussion? I mean, I think that they got out of it that he, any time, any specific, he would declare that the Sharia law was beautiful and we should bring it about. And then he'd just deny that parts of the Sharia law were Sharia law over and over and over again. And he is someone who will campaign possibly for the rest of his life, unless he leaves Islam, which is quite possible because he's now at that incredibly ah, stage where he's just screaming out. Hey, this, this Safraz will send me six or eight emails in a day, not even in the same chain. All right. Just random emails. And I'll log in. I'll be like, oh, my gosh, I'll reply to them whenever if I do at all. And he'll just send me six more. Right. So he is absolutely uh, kicking against the goads, shall we say. And he knows that it's false, but he may spend the rest of his life in denial and trying to bring about this Sharia that he finds personally reprehensible. And I think that we see, we have all seen here clearly that Muslims who are better than their Sharia are nevertheless in a position where they feel like they must work to bring it about and say that it's a good thing, but then just deny the parts of it that they don't like 
for convenience. So uh, Golden Islam says he has to drop off. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank I you. really enjoyed Join hearing us again. your perspective. Yeah, you're welcome back any time. Uh, any final thoughts from you? No, I, I, I've, I've looked at Lloyd's work. I think you're doing a great job um, bringing the resources uh, online, especially I think you've started sharing them on the Google Drive. I think that's amazing. People never had access to that. Uh, but yeah, I, I just request, uh, please let's all criti critically analyze Islam, but not demonize uh, Muslims. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think we can all agree with that. Uh, thank you I'm again for joining us today. Yeah, I want to save them. I want to save them out of this awful, awful thing that they're trapped in. Bye. Bye. Thank you. So we had a, a super chat earlier from uh, Rashad Perry. Good job to Lloyd, Reasoned, and the female participant. That would be Mary. <laughs> Safraz is a dangerous person. Thank you very much for that donation. And that is true. Those ideas perpetuated like that, mo you know, motivated as he is and committed as he is, that those are dangerous ideas. He's going to want to make this a reality. Yeah, in all seriousness, um, Safraz is on a path. It, one of two things is going to happen. Either he's going to realize how ridiculous what he's fighting for is and abandon it, or there's a very high probability that he will become a jihadi. Uh, you know, Alonzo is a weak coward. He would never do that. He, all he can do is sit in comments. Safraz is bold. Safraz is very motivated. He isn't necessarily very good at making arguments, but he is confident. He does have uh, a lot of zeal for his religion, and he's just going to continue to pursue that. And he's either going to reach the point where he realizes how ridiculous this is, where he realizes how he has to lie constantly and, and abandon that, or he's going to become a jihadi. And I think that's a reality. I mean, every, every reference he told us to go look at, we proved him wrong. I mean, seriously, it's like, like how good grief. How dumb do you have to be? Oh, I also want to say something very quickly about him claiming that in numbers, that was about having intercourse with inter underage girls. If you go to Deuteronomy 21, which 2111, which gives you the laws, if you're going to marry or if you want to have intercourse with a captive, okay, it starts out. If you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and are attracted to her, to her you may take her as your wife. That word is used of adults only. It's exclusive to adults. Yeah, I did uh, a very lengthy three-hour series, I think, on sex and marriage in the Talmud, because I know that people love to talk about the Talmud and compare it to Islam, and they are nothing, absolutely nothing alike. This is not to say the Talmud is holy. Of course, it is. It is the Sharia is the Talmud of Islam. It's the Talmud of the Quran, just like the Talmud is the Talmud of the Torah. But the two are nothing alike. It, the, 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 sh the Sharia corrupts and inverts and, and just, just it, 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 it's shocking to see how it just inverts the, the, the laws of the Torah. And obviously we're, we're not teaching on this specific passage, so we won't go into great detail here, but I did want to point out that great care is taken here to ensure that the the male being uh, marrying this captive is not doing so because they're physically attracted to her. The, there is great effort placed to make the woman as unattractive as possible so that it can only be done for a pure motive. Mm -hmm. This is in contrast to you know the, the teachings that we just looked at from the, the Sharia where all that matters is the guardian's opinion. The woman has no say in it whatsoever. Yeah, and, and notice can, that if you if you have taken a woman who is captive, you can only take her as a wife. You can't keep her as a slave. That was abolished with this Mosaic law. You could not have a slave who has a different status than a wife. The difference between a wife and a concubine in the Mosaic law is whether or not she gets a divorce payment if she's divorced. And... Here, you know, she does not get a divorce payment if she's divorced because she was not married with a dowry. 
Um, so sh you cannot have sex slaves. You cannot buy and sell sex slaves. None of these things are allowed. You cannot treat her as a slave, if even if you don't later? want her. Yeah, doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't <laughs> matter. If it's Twenty years later, then yeah. doesn't the law change? <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yep. That yeah, was in the uh, yeah, olden time, twenty years ago. <laughs> Mary, don't you know that Deuteronomy was abrogated when, when uh, <laughs> Moses changed his mind? Yeah, because that's how it works. Yeah. I mean, but uh, uh, we'll close out here in a second. But I just wanted to take a few relevant comments from the audience. Uh, Cordy, to your point, Lloyd said in 1940, only 7 percent of Germans identified as Nazis. But how did that turn out? You know, to your well. point that. Only a couple percent of uh, people have to believe in the the violent commands of the Sharia for them to become a reality. Uh, uh, there's a question here. Is there any way to amend the Sharia law? The America's no. Constitution can be amended by three different methods. No. Can Sharia Muslims be amended? must respond violently to any attempt with violence. They must respond with aggression, harsh language, and violence if there's any attempt to alter these laws because this goes, it was understand that imposing the sharia is the great commission of islam this is their great commission to command the right and forbid the wrong in other words to impose the sharia and prevent anything that is not sharia and as i was going to say this goes to the muslim understanding of truth you know we were going to get into this a little you, you'll have to stay tuned for that to be rescheduled the original presentation um but the the Muslim understanding of truth is very different than the the Christian or Western understanding, where you know m most people in the Western world, if they unless they assert there is no such thing as truth at all, they assert to something like uh, uh, a correspondence theory, where something's true if it matches something in objective reality. Whereas Islam's theory of truth is that whatever that truth is handed down by Allah. And it's determined by the consensus of the, the scholars. So it can't change because if it were to change, that would mean truth changed. If the consensus on laws changes, if you have amendments to the Constitution, so to speak, that means that truth changed, that a law is not truth anymore because he is the one who gave this. Correct. Yeah, this would uh, contradict the so, laws on wood. Yeah. So Villainous said that uh, I think you should open it up at the end next time. Well, that's what we normally do. But I, I brought this up because I, I wanted to explain why we brought Safraz up. Well, uh, Safraz Lloyd has, has never agreed. And finally, so we had to take it. Yes, exactly. Lloyd has spent the last two to three years asking every Muslim he sees to to come up live and defend the beauty of the Sharia law, and yes. no one was ever willing to do it. Literally, no one ever was willing to come up before. So when Safra says, "I want to come up to 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 declare that Islamic law is beautiful," and, uh, so I put in the chat, "We'll bring you up, but only if that's what you actually talk about." And to his credit, he came up and he tried to defend that idea. Uh, so we had to take that opportunity. So that's why we got off topic today. I think that you can chop off pieces of live streams, so you might want to just chop it off to the beginning of the discussion so that then he can do his whole presentation and people won't think that there's repeats. Yes, yeah, we, we might do that. I'll, I'll have to look at what it looks like, you know, by actually playing it back. But I might do that and just break, start it at when Safraz comes well, up and then we'll just I did say that the will is manipulation of reality. And I mean, we saw plenty of that kind of behavior, that, that, that refusal to accept truth and to manipulate reality with words, because logos is to seek the truth, to speak the truth, and will is to deny the truth and attempt to manipulate it, to basically use word magic to deny reality. And that's what surprise was doing. Yeah, and we do have a request to, um, it says, what's the link to come online in another session would be good to go back to the Regensburg lecture. Uh, I'll have to discuss with Floyd. I don't think that he's, you know, prepared to spend another hour here. So no. we'll reschedule that for another time. And I'll announce that as soon as we have uh, a specific time for that. 
Uh, one more question here from John Smith. Uh, how long did it take to develop any particular school of Islamic law? Do we know anything about that? So, so major so the <clears throat> for instance, the Talmud took what five six hundred years to develop, right? So, I mean, there was there was a core development period, for instance, of about four hundred years and another couple of hundred years of refinement. Now, the Sharia started in roughly the eight hundreds, the middle eight hundreds, but the major scholar Shafi, who developed the philosophy that is in, well current today, was not accepted for roughly a century, almost a century. So, talking eight hundred and fifty, the middle of the ninth century, and it was finished in roughly the early twelfth century. However, certain refinement and development continued until the early sixteenth century. So, there are certain certain pieces that were still added up to the 1500s. So you can definitely, or at least the late 1400s. So you can say the Sharia took roughly, in total, uh, if you're looking at 800s, 900s, 1000s, 1100s, 1200s, 800 to 900 years. Yeah, and, and to be clear, uh, it didn't necessarily start when Islam started either. And that, you know, no, much of the law goes back to tribal law prior to um, Islam. So basically Yemeni tribal law. There's also certain elements of Roman law and uh, of course, Jewish law, I mean, which they've corrupted. Yeah, sorry, that is. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say that uh, this is true of all Islam. You know, we, we kind of have the standard narrative in our mind, even if we reject it. Uh, even if we reject the details, we kind of still have that framework in our mind that, you know, Islam came into the scene all of a sudden in a short period of time. Um, you know, we might dispute the, the exact details, but in reality, I think it was a system that developed very slowly over a long period of time, probably predating, starting predating Muhammad, if that is actually the, the founder of the religion, and incorporating all these elements into it. And then it continued to change, especially in response to polemics against it. People saying, and, you know, the, these aren't. This isn't revelation from God. This is just copied tales of the ancients. Oh, well, we need to come up with something to dispute that. I know Muhammad was illiterate. He he, he couldn't mm -hmm. have copied stories because he was illiterate. Uh, yeah. That kind of thing. Uh, why should we follow your prophet? He didn't work any miracles. All the biblical prophets worked miracles, especially Jesus. He had the most spectacular miracles, which authenticated himself. Oh. Uh, I know the Quran says a hundred times that he didn't work any miracles, but guess what? He actually did. Just read all these other texts that we've just written that, that talk about all the yeah. miracles he performed. In fact, oh, uh, yeah. when, Islam, when, when Islam became an empire, they had to develop a political system to manage that empire. And they borrowed that from the Neoplatonists. They specifically took from Plato's idea of the perfect state and they modified that. The scholar that did that is called Al-Farabi. And I will be talking about him briefly in my discussion. That is, maybe we can do a series on the Sharia like I'm doing with Jay, but but actually stick closer to the actual talk that I want. <laughs> you know, oh, you know, let's not put the cart before the horse, but put the horse before the cart and just that might be interesting because there's a lot. They stole a lot from the Greeks in that respect and from many other cultures. Yes, Mary. Oh, I was going to say that uh, Abu Huraira it brought like six or seven thousand ahadith. Okay, and he is like yeah. the number one reporter of ahadith from among the companions of Muhammad. Can anyone tell me how for how many years he knew Muhammad? Well, number one not reporter, at all, I believe. Not at all, I think. Yeah, I've read this. It's I can't remember the facts, but yeah, it's, it's two and a possible. half years. Two okay. and a half years were all the time that he had with Muhammad, yet he's the number one source for our hadith. And if you go back to the early stuff, the earlier you go in his career, suddenly the same people who even among the people who are like, oh, yes, I converted to Islam. I was the first person ever from uh, Medina who traveled to Mecca and converted immediately. And yet you'll find that he says almost nothing about the first 10 years or so of Muhammad's career because Muhammad changed his theology so radically because you can see it in the Quran. It, it changes that there are these layers of revision. And if you cut down to the bottom layer of the cake, what's being taught is 
fantastically different than what's on the top, much less the icing and the decorations and the candles and everything else, it, it's everything beyond that. It's so far, so far different from what is actually at that base layer of the cake. Yeah, and actually the, the, the narrations about Muhammad become more detailed as you go into the future. As you go further back, there's less detail and they start to add detail the further away you get from from the time of Muhammad, which is which is very, very suspect. Absolutely. And just a couple more comments here. So, yeah, we should call it. This went a lot longer than anticipated. I had 23 slides I was going to go through, just 23. Which was... <laughs> I know. You said this might just be an hour, and now we're at two and a half. <laughs> but that, these comments Poor will be Lloyd. very quick. Uh, so I wanted to bring up this one. Uh, Brother Lloyd, your expertise is top notch. Thanks for your participation Thank you. in the program. Uh, Vilna said extra Quranic sources of Sharia will be very interesting, Lloyd. So that's an endorsement to do that. It's weird how that's cooking. not really been done. It's just that certain people will not be named. Said that said that certain material I wanted to talk about was too too much of a lecture and a little boring. But it's, <laughs> it's actually critical for understanding because it's I, not. I, yeah. yeah, go on. Sorry. I was going to say, no worries. My audience here is used to boring lectures. <laughs> I've never been accused of being the, boring. The, this is the channel that. This is the channel where we get to go into the academic depth of the topic, not just uh, put out a sound yeah. bite. I mean, here. you can when you go into the Greek sources that the that the Islamic scholars took, like if you go into Farabi, Al Farabi, and you go into how he modeled the Islamic state, the the after the the structure of the Islamic state is modeled after the Greek concept of the perfect state by Plato and the Neoplatonists. You actually start to see that one of the not the only but one of the models of Muhammad is clearly a Greek. Neoplatonic figure and a cultic figure as well, a cultic figure. So you will actually n notice the parallels with this particular Greek individual and Muhammad, and we can do that in the future. Absolutely. You know, only, yeah. Yep. Uh, Carol says, We love boring. Boring <laughs> is where the info is. <laughs> so, and th now yeah. we, uh, Sorry, a couple super chats came in, so you're going to have to stay a couple minutes longer here because I have to take those. Uh, Christopher Hussein nice. said on Deuteronomy 21:11, we need to link it to Genesis 3:6. When you see a woman, desire and take. It's the same Hebrew from the woman in the garden. It's negative, and um, you know I can't speak to this exact passage because I would have to, you know, confirm that, but I can say that this is definitely true of the Bible in general. It's strangely enough to Muslims. It's one cohesive narrative. It doesn't just randomly jump around, randomly repeat things. Things are in the Bible for a reason. Everything's linked together from creation to revelation. It's one continuous story. So everything connects together. So um, you know, I can't speak of the exact verbs in those passages, but I, definitely an idea to keep in mind. Yeah, and this uh, see, desire, and take, what comes after this is the remedy for this. Is the remedy for this, des this uh, see, desire, and desire to take that might, not be, that might be highly unwholesome, well then you need to do all of these things first to make sure that it isn't unwholesome like this. Thank you for that. Uh, Boris asked, how did you learn all this, Lloyd? If you could give a five-sentence Brief. summary. <laughs> I mean, take as much so time prior, as you want. But <laughs> yeah, Prior to 2015, I knew that there was more to Islam than Quran and Hadith. They want us to believe that Islam is just Quran and Hadith. It is absolutely not. The Quran and Hadith are superseded by later texts, the Sharia, the Fiqh, the Islamic law. 2015, fall of Raqqa, ISIS documents captured. A, I had access to a trove of documents, which was what the ISIS jihadis were studying in their seminaries. And there were a number of these Islamic law texts, and I had never heard of these. And I was like, why have we not heard of these? And I started reading them, and they started to give far better explanation of what Islam was, how they behaved, what they did, why they did it, how they believed it, that expanded upon the Hadith, that expanded upon the Quran. And I started to learn these things. I read them intently. And... 
I started to find the other texts and the different scholars that were authoritative in, and uh, that's when I learned this. So it's lost seven years, roughly. Well, I've been studying Islam longer than that, but the last seven years, the Sharia, I started reading in depth and I have an entire library of 1,400 books that you can access, 15 gigabytes worth of these docs and um, check in on my videos for the links and you'll be able to access the relevant ones there. Excellent. Yes, the, I put that in the description of this video as well already, um, but I'll put it in a pinned comment too. Uh, just a couple quick comments. Whatever this is, boring it is not. Well, thank you, Marion, for that. Uh, Troy English gave a super chat. Keep the truth coming. Absolutely, Troy. That is the plan here. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, it's always good to hear that people yeah. are enjoying this material, that um, that people are finding it beneficial. And I just ask in return that you take it and apply. You know, you use this material in your conversations with Muslims because that's what this is really about. This is about reaching Muslims. If people find it entertaining, great. If people find it boring but useful, that's all right as well because what we really are aiming here is to provide material that helps people witness to Muslims. Yeah. I also hope that our discussion, I know it was a three-on-one, people can view it that way, but I hope we didn't come across as ganging up on Safraz. He's been a pain in my bum for, excuse my French, for a long time. <laughs> and I've wanted to have this guy up to talk about this. And I hope it sounded as if we were asking questions and trying to get to the bottom of things rather than ganging up on him, that we gave him sufficient time to talk, that it sounded like we had a reasonable dialogue. I hope that didn't come across as us just beating up on him. Well, I think that whenever I ask him to do talk fear, and he just suddenly reversed. Did you guys notice that? Whenever of course, you he's lying. declare he's lying. talk I mean, he, fear, he, he... yeah. Whenever you declare talk fear, you're basically saying that these people are apostates. They do not recognize rec uh, represent Islam. They're wrong. And he was saying that this is not Islam. This is not Islam. It does not represent Islam. These are wrong beliefs. You shouldn't teach these yep. and say that's Islam. And so I said, fine. So declare talk fear. Say that all these folks are not Muslim, not true Muslims, and he would not. He immediately changed course. And that's why he, anytime he was said, okay, stand up for what you're saying right now, he'd just run away and say no. I am yeah. desperate to talk to him about the paraclete, which is the whole reason I joined the chat. But of course, you know, that was not the we, subject. We, we didn't get there, so we <laughs> next do, time, and, next time. <laughs> that's fine. That's totally fine. Well, Palestine did the very same. He was like, these are not true Muslims. I mean, well, Pakistan Palestine is, not true Muslims, is a... Right? Yeah, he's a Quranist, so he is going to affirm none Quran them, alone, which does not even none really exist. Of them, we know that that's just an excuse. Well, it's there like, are like, new groups. On, if Muslims had to criticize the Bible, it's like me saying, "Sorry, no, 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 no. I'm a gospel of John onlyist. That's the only. <laughs> well, no, no. I'm a gospel of John onlyist. No, no, no. Only that. There. Oh, yeah. No, not not that verse in John. I don't do that one. I don't. <laughs> it's nonsense. It's nonsense. Well, there, there are there are groups of people now. In, who call themselves Muslims, who really do, and some of them like wildly reinterpret things in other ways. And there are there are chat rooms, debate rooms, where the Quranists and the um, the uh, Sunnis and Shias all fight with the Quran only Muslims who say that it's no, no, no. To do that. It yeah, is it is. It is apostasy. Legal. You're you're. But the question the question for them always is: So, did Allah come? and just not have it were there no muslims before just now recently when this movement started what are, are, are you telling me that these people were not true muslims because none of them had your posi position there's not one group in the first thousand years plus of islam that said no i'm going to look at the quran only and that's my only source there's there's, there's nothing like that like yep. nothing you know, you know, if you really want to see inconsistency in Islam, talk about the story of Abraham who destroyed all of the idols in the Kaaba. Remember he sent Hagar to the desert where she found the well, but there was no Kaaba. And then Abraham repaired the Kaaba, which had been built by Adam, but there was no Kaaba at the well of Zamzam because Hagar went there. There was no Kaaba. So Abraham had to build the Kaaba, which was not there, but he repaired the Kaaba and then he had smashed all the idols. But Abraham was already a believer by then, so why would he put idols in the Kaaba that he just built? You know, but he'd repaired the Kaaba, so if the Kaaba had been repaired and it wasn't there, why would he put idols inside it? And if he'd built it new, why would he put idols inside it to smash them? Because he was a pagan when he was already 
a Muslim. You know, it, it, that whole story, that is is one of the weakest things in Islam. I mean, that story, when you show with them, the, the chronology, how stupid it is, it's like, man, it's indefensible. Yeah, I definitely want to respect uh, you two's time. So cool. let me just read a couple quick comments cool. and then we'll sign off here. Uh, Blue Reaper said, could you explain Genesis 18? If you ask a specific question about it in the the comments yeah. afterwards, I'd be happy to address that. Uh, or if you just want me to, you know, give a summary of the text, I can do that as well. But I, I have a feeling you probably want to ask a specific question. So if you could just do that in the comments afterwards, I'd be happy to address that. Carol B makes a very good point. They will declare that most Muslims don't follow the rules, but when pressed, the Ummah closes ranks. And that is a fact. That is a fact. They will close ranks and they all follow the same tune all of a sudden. Uh, and John Smith asked a rhetorical question. How can a Muslim be a Quranist? Uh, how did he get to the Quran? Uh, how did he get the Quran in his hands in the first place? It's in the Hadith and absolutely it's a completely logically inconsistent position to be like all these all these early Muslims that that made it these Hadith. They're all liars, but we trust them to give us the Quran. I mean, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, he also said now I understand why it takes more than eight years to become a sheikh all the holes and how to avoid them <laughs> well put there and and to the point of what we were talking about sharia law there's many 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 laws to learn and you have to learn it you know becoming a, a sheikh isn't exceptions. isn't learning the quran it's <laughs> learning the the scholar's opinion of that scholar whose opinion of that other scholar you know it's a giant maze to navigate you have to understand what everyone said about everyone else and then yeah. finally, I wanted to close on this comment. Safras is what you get when God has no Lagos, no reason. Islam has no Lagos, no reason. So many Muslims end up like Safras, incoherent. And that is the truth. And I must state in Sharia law, confusion. Remember, they always say Allah is not a God of confusion. Well, in the Sharia, it states that confusion can benefit Islam. Absolutely. Then, you know, what what's right is what benefits Islam and what's wrong is what uh, is detrimental to it. This is how they understand right and wrong, not some deep moral uh, conception like we might have. So thank you all for joining us today. We'll reschedule the original presentation for another day, but hopefully you found this discussion with Safraz and uh, Golden Era of Islam helpful. Uh, I certainly think that it was beneficial. I, we got to see how a Muslim weaves and dives, and, and you can see why they never want to talk about the Sharia, because they're embarrassed by what it teaches. They know that what it teaches is detrimental to Islam, and therefore they should not talk about it, in addition to the explicit commands not to talk about it. But if Safraz is one thing, he is brash. He is not wise about what he comes up and talks about. So we were happy to take that opportunity and do that. I will be on Bob's channel tomorrow. We'll be discussing the death of Muhammad from a historical standpoint. And later this week, I'll have an announcement about a new project that I'm working on, so stay tuned for that as well. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day and a great week. Go and serve the Lord. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.